Hello everyone. On behalf of HAM and Helsinki Biennial, I want to warmly welcome you to the second edition of Helsinki Biennial Talks. I'm Jonna Hurskainen, Head of Production of the Helsinki Biennial. The Helsinki Biennial Talk series began two weeks ago with a lecture with Dr. Paul O'Neill. Thank you for the inspiring lecture, Paul. Today's conversation brings together biennial directors and curators from around the world. When we were planning the Helsinki Biennial program in 2019, we recognized the importance of sharing knowledge with the international art scene. We decided to invite Paul to plan a series of talks with us that put Helsinki Biennial in the into the context of art biennials around the world. We are more than happy that Paul was willing to work with us and created this wonderful series of talks. Paul will now tell you about today's conversation and introduce our guests. The floor or the screen is yours, Paul. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and uh, welcome everybody, uh, wherever you may be. Uh, wherever you may be um, interacting with your screen, whether it be large, small or otherwise. Um, hope you're all well, hope you're all safe and um, thank you for joining us. I'm sure you uh, have lots of other uh, online digital activities to engage with currently in our lives. Um, so I'm very grateful that you've chosen to spend the evening with, with uh, with me and uh, my five guests, who I will introduce um, as the um, the afternoon, evening, or morning progresses, depending on where you are in the world. Um, uh, as was said, this is the second in the uh, series of three um, Helsinki Biennial Talks, uh, the first of which um, was in the form of a lecture, which took place on uh, March the 3rd and is now uh, online on the Helsinki Biennial YouTube channel and on their Facebook channel. So um, the reason or rationale behind that particular lecture was to uh, look at the uh, effect of biennials um, as a model, as a construct of globalism and globalization um, in parallel with the development of contemporary art of the last 30 years. And in a way, uh, this lecture was a way of contextualizing how we got here and how we got here today without uh, offering any, um, uh, so maybe perhaps some speculation on the future and on the present current moment in time, but it's uh, hopefully framed our discussion um, that we will hope to uh, begin this evening and also to continue uh, over the next uh, couple, of, couple of weeks. So I am delighted to um, uh, have uh, five wonderful um, guests this evening from who will be joining us from Helsinki, uh, from Delhi, uh, from Stockholm and from Limerick in Ireland. And this uh, talk, if you like, will take the form of um, three presentations um, and I will introduce um, each of the speakers um, who will each focus on uh, a particular approach to a biennial perennial exhibition model in uh, the specific context within which they were invited uh, to uh, either be a director, a curator uh, or an artist um, curator uh, and uh, will share um, presentations, uh, each individual presentation um, uh, and share their presentation on screen for you. And I will introduce each of the speakers uh, individually we will not have questions after each of the presentations. Instead, we will have three presentations, one after another. And these uh, three presentations, um, when they are uh, completed, we will, I will collate questions and comments. I have two uh, laptops here in front of me. So if you see me moving, looking left and right, uh, I'm actually trying to see what comments and questions and so forth are coming in from from you, from the audience, uh, where, where, wherever you are. So please send in your comments, uh, send in your questions, and please, if you can, indicate uh, who you are, uh, if I can't see that, um, and also perhaps who you would wish to ask the, uh, the question to. 
Um, but as I said, uh, we're joined today by um, a director of um, Ireland's biennial uh, EVA Int International. Uh, we're invited, we have an invited curator of the uh, Tent uh, Momentum Nordic Biennial from 2018, and we have the uh, curator, curators and artistic directors of the Yokohama Triennial 2020. So we are approaching the subject of biennials from multiple roles, multiple positions and multiple functions within the context of such a large scale uh, global um, exhibition model. And these three uh, contextual presentations uh, will hopefully um, uh, generate comments, generate discussion, generate uh, critical response um, uh, by you. And hopefully we will find some way in this uh, uh, less than interactive medium, um, we will somehow try and find a way to have a conversation amongst each other and also amongst with our, with our, uh, with our guest speakers. Um, and the, the, the schedule will be as follows. We will have a presentation by um, uh, Matt Packer, who, is, uh, who will present on, uh, as the biennial director of uh, EVA International and look at the kind of local and global context of, um, of that particular perennial uh, exhibition and look at the gaps in between. Uh, Biennials, what happens when the biennial is not actually live, when it is not yet an event, what happens in between within the specific, specific local cultural context of uh, Limerick and Ireland, for example. Then we will have, um, uh, very quickly afterwards, we will have Marty Mannon on the role of the biennial curator, specifically looking at Momentum 10, uh, which was uh, the, which is, as, as many of you know, the only current uh, biennial in the world that calls itself the Nordic Biennial. So in a way, we're hoping that Marty will share some light on this, the particularities of curating a modest uh, international biennial, but in, a, in the Nordic context. And also, Marty is uh, director of Index in Stockholm, so he's very familiar with, with uh, with working within um, the context, which many of you may be most familiar with, uh, if, if coming from, from Finland or Helsinki. And then thirdly, we will have um, Rocks Media Collective, uh, who will present um, as artist curators um, uh, and also as artistic directors of the Yokohama Triennial in 2020, which was actually realized last year um, somehow. Um, um, during the, the, the pandemic and took a very trans, uh, trans global approach. And uh, I will introduce each of the speakers in more detail uh, following each of the presentations. Um, and I will, my role will really to keep them uh, on track in terms of their timekeeping and then also to collate um, questions from, from you and, to, and from, from, from our speakers and uh, try to kind of generate some kind of a conversation uh, after these three presentations and then this will be followed by a critical response from Taro Elfing who um, is a curator based in Helsinki and uh, very internationally active and Taro will will shed some reflection on our discussion and uh, perhaps maybe open up open up the uh, the conversation again depending on on how the uh, how we are flowing and uh, Hopefully, hopefully we have allowed enough time to enable uh, you to feel part of uh, the conversation and to be in dialogue and in conversation with our incredible, incredible guests. So I would like to firstly uh, introduce um, Matt Packer, uh, who is the director and CEO of EVA International, uh, which is Ireland's Biennial of Contemporary Arts. And Matt has held many uh, previous roles, which have included the director of the CCA in uh, uh, Derry, London Derry, uh, between 2014 and 17. Uh, prior to that, he was associate director at Tregnac Project uh, between 2013 and 16. He was uh, also curator of exhibitions and projects at the Lewis Glucksmann Gallery in the University College uh, Cork uh, between 2008 and 2013. And he has curated many exhibitions and projects um, 
internationally uh, as an independent curator prior and also during his uh, various uh, directorships or his uh, institutional positions which have included the Tulsa uh, Festival of Visual Arts in Galway, um, exhibition called Disappearing Acts in the Foton, which many of you will be familiar with in a uh, Norwegian context, uh, which was co-curated. And he has been on the selection committee for British uh, representation in Venice in 2017. And he's on the advisor of uh, what could or should curating do educational program in Belgrade. He is also co-founder of Occasional Groundworks, which was is a very international, very uh, active network partnership uh, between EVA International, uh, the Gothenburg International Biennial of Contemporary Art, which we will hear a little bit more about uh, on March uh, 31st with uh, curator Nav Pak. And also uh, Matt Packer has been, uh, and then the other partner is Lofoten International Art Festival. So all rethinking small to medium scale biennial models within a regional uh, European context. So I think it's a very interesting initiative and maybe Matt will reflect a little bit up on this network of uh, small scale uh, biennials. Uh, Matt has also contributed regularly uh, to um, various uh, various magazines and journals, including Freeze, Kaleidoscope, and uh, Van Visual Arts Newsletter, or new sheet, I should say, uh, and has looked at the various thematic intersections between uh, contemporary art and internationalism. So I'm very, um, very grateful to have Matt Packer as our first speaker this evening, and uh, Matt will speak for about 25, 20 to 25 minutes, and. Uh, welcome, Matt. Uh, sorry, we can't see each other on screen yet, but um, yeah, there you are. Lovely to see you and hope you're well. And uh, hopefully we can have a little bit of a chat later on. OK, thanks, Matt. Over to you. Uh, thanks, Paul. And hello, everyone. Um, it's a real pleasure to be um, invited to this series. And um, it's, a, it's a particular honor to share this virtual stage with, with, the, other, with the other panelists whose work I very much admire. And respect. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, I really appreciate the opportunity to to speak and give a short introduction to Eva International. Um, yeah, that's my first slide. So I'm just going to jump straight into it. In this talk, I'm not really going to do a, a show and tell of of Eva International, but I'm going to try and speak to this general question of the future of the the, the BNL model through looking back at the history of EVA International, of which I've been the, the director since uh, 2017. And I'm specifically gonna talk through uh, EVA's history of inviting international curators to curate its various editions, touching on the, the dynamic conditions of those invitations and the infrastructural context in which those invitations were made. In general, I would argue that within the discourse that circulates around the biennial, there hasn't been enough space or regard or commentary for the, uh, for the organizational and infrastructural narratives that invite curating into being. You know, perhaps there aren't people out there that are interested in this stuff, but I certainly am. And uh, this presentation, I guess, represents a, a modest attempt to redress some of that uh, from the specific perspective of Eva. So um, Eva's beginnings date back to 1977, um, which is a date that you know, predates a lot of the cultural infrastructure that now exists in, in, in Ireland. It predates the Irish Museum of Modern Art, for example. It predates Ireland's sustained presence at the Venice Biennale. And it predates most of the regional contemporary arts uh, network that has since popped up in Ireland over the past 20 or 30 years. And so, it's therefore quite easy to look back and see that Eva's early development was a, a kind of response to a deficit that existed in Ireland at that time. You know, there was a lack of artistic opportunity, there was a lack of institutional support, there was a lack of networked artistic discourse and international access. And this was the, you know, the kind of problematic environment that the arts communities in Ireland in the 70s and 80s were operating in and were, were self-aware of. 
And it was this problem to which Eva proposed itself as something of a solution. So, you know, from the very beginning then, Eva didn't start like so many uh, biennial type projects with a kind of touristic city attraction type of logic that was dreamt up in a, a boardroom or in a planning office. It was dreamt up from within the artistic field. And although Eva has taken many shapes and adjusted its identity over the years, um, it's, it's been the appointment of international curators for each edition that has been a consistent strategy of approach to this, to this very day. So the curators that have been involved in Eva over the past 40 years continues to be Eva's main narrative. And this list from Germano Salant to Katrina Gregos to Hu Hanru to Koyo Kyo, I mean, they include some of the key figures in curatorial history, whose association, of course, we uh, at Eva and here in Limerick were very proud of. But of course, this history of individuals masks other narratives and counter narratives of the organization's own development. And the extent to which this kind of grand curatorial history has actually contributed to Eva's own creative and strategic confidences as an organization, you know, this is very much a preoccupation I've had um, and I've been wrestling with since becoming director back in 2017. So, there's been four phases to Eva's history, um, which I'm going to touch on briefly. Each kind of correspond to different shifts in terms of curatorial appointment. There was a first phase that dated from 1977 to 1992, where Eva was delivered as an annual project, where a local voluntary committee invited international guest curators, such as people like Brian O'Doherty, Rudy Fuchs, Saskia Boss, they invited them to Limerick to make a selection of work for a single venue exhibition in Limerick. Uh, can we have the next slide, please? And uh, during this period, you know, the, these, these curators who were formally appointed as adjudicators were tasked with selecting artworks through an open call process and handing out prizes. These submissions almost exclusively being from artists that were based in Ireland. So in this slide, you know, there's just an image of uh, Sandy Nairn, who was a curator of the Eva edition in 1979, uh, like leafing through a number of works that have been sort of dropped off at, um, uh, at, at, at an art centre for his adjudication. And on, on the right hand side of the slide is an uh, advertisement that was placed in Circa magazine, which was an arts magazine that was um, the kind of primary magazine, uh, arts magazine in Ireland at the time. In inviting submissions. So this is very much, you know, the kind of way it worked. And there are some incredible and instructive examples in the early catalogues that give some indication of the of the tensions of curatorial invitation into a context that was unfamiliar to these curators. And for instance, we'll just go on to the next slide. In the 1984 catalog, Peter Fuller um, who curated Eva that year, he describes, and I quote, I must admit that when I arrived at Shannon Airport, I felt vulnerable. Ireland simply seems so far away from those theatres of aesthetic struggle with which I was familiar. This feeling was extenuated when I, I was whisked into those bleak storerooms in Parnell Street, where all the works were gathered together for my adjudication. I was immediately aware of the insufferable arrogance of what I was doing. And Germano Salant, who curated Eva in 1991, he was even more critical of the invitation. He describes how he received the invitation to curate Eva by unsolicited facts, how he admired the invitation for being very naive. And he went on to make the point that he typically says no to these kinds of things. And he only said yes, because it, you know, Ireland being a poor country, he, he, he saw his acceptance as a political decision over and above a decision that would uh, represent an opportunity to develop or advantage as curatorial practice and profile. So with these anecdotes and with these examples, I'm certainly not trying to embarrass or undo the legacy of these curators that have contributed so much to Eva's history. But my point is that they demonstrate the way that Eva as an organization was kind of trapped, right, between the dependency of seeking and inviting the judgment of these international curators and its own incapacity to manage and care and develop upon those relationships. And what's 
also obvious and remarkable is that these statements, these statements that I've just read out, the statement that's on the screen, they were actually and assertively put into the public domain by the curators themselves, published in catalogues that had a readership that was limited to a local arts public in Ireland. These excerpts are like curatorial confessions addressed back into the context that conditioned their invitation. Uh, if you can go on to the next slide, please. So um, following this first phase, there was a second phase from 1994 to 2011 that was pretty similar to the first. Um, Eva was still an annual project at this stage. The main difference being that the open call process was blended with a more typical and familiar process of direct curatorial invitations, curators, uh, appointed curators inviting artists to present and produce their work for each edition. And this uh, had the, the consequences of, of, of uh, the artist list and these editions becoming increasingly international. In this phase, the exhibition also became kind of less exhibitionary in a sense. It was less orientated to venues and more orientated to works taking place in public spaces and pedagogical and performance events, for instance. And in this period, it coincided with a formal change of title from adjudicator to curator in 2000, where um, uh, that coincided with uh, uh, Rosa Martinez's edition that year. And these, these changes, these changes both to uh, the title of appointment, but also changes in, in um, exhibition approach, of course, represented a growing awareness of curatorial professionalism and practice as it was felt and felt and, and flowed through an Irish context. But the appointment of these international curators continued to open up discrepancies and deficits in Ireland's cultural infrastructural fabric, albeit in a slightly different way than before. So, um, you know, Ireland's lack of reputational profile was suggested as late as 2007 in Hu Han Ru's introductory essay to the catalogue that year, where he describes that for many people from different parts of the world, Ireland is an unknown land situated at the edge of Europe. There was no reason to go to Ireland except in search of something mysterious and bizarre. In other editions, Eva's infrastructural missives were suggested but more proactively addressed by curators such as Salah Hassan, who in his 2002 edition focused uh, program resources on establishing an international residency program for a selection of the Irish artists that participated in EVA that year. He granted them opportunities to travel in partnership with residency organizations that Hassan himself brokered within his network. Those artists traveling out to India, Trinidad, Ethiopia, Kenya, Pakistan and Egypt. Uh, if we can go on to the next slide. So obviously I'm moving, I'm moving through time and becoming increasingly contemporary. Uh, we're now into a third phase, which, which um, I guess is between about 2012 and 2018, where Eva adopted a biannual program schedule. It was no longer an annual project, it had become biannual. And although Eva still had this open call process for artist submissions, that was something of an anachronism compared to other projects of its type during this period, it became, you could say, like more strategically self-aware than ever of its place within a circuitry of other small to, to medium scale international biennials. At this point, Eva rebranded itself as Ireland's Biennial of Contemporary Art, and it established for the first time a small organizational in, uh, structure, a director and a small team. Whereas previous curatorial appointments had tended to be made in terms of institutional affiliation or geographies of knowledge, the appointment of curators like Bassemar Baroni and Koyo Kyo, they represented invitations to extend distinct curatorial research methodologies into a context like Limerick. Koyo's um, 2016 edition, Still the Barbarians, offered a response on the history, of leg uh, history and legacy of Ireland's colonial past reflected through the African experience, uh, coinciding with the, with the centenary of the 1916 Easter Rising that same year. So by this time, in this, in this third phase, uh, you could say, a lot has changed across the cultural landscape in Ireland in general. 
Uh, notwithstanding a major economic crisis that, uh, that hit Ireland particularly hard in 2008, there had been enormous growth in, in terms of professional facility, connectivity and confidence that um, in, in, specifically in terms of artist networks and the educational programs that were on offer for artists, you know, rendered a completely different set of opportunities for, 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 for a new generation of artists that were working in and out of the country. And so when I became director in 2017, and full credit to my predecessor, uh, Woodrow Kernahan, Eva at, at that point had become the largest visual arts event in the country, and it was one of the few organizations that was fluidly working and thinking internationally, both in terms of curatorial appointments, in its platforming of Irish artists, but also in terms of how it communicated and imagined its public. Yet, yeah, it was also obvious that the bones of the organization itself hadn't really kept pace with those changes. In, excuse me, in 40 years of curatorial work in Limerick, there was still relatively little material, curatorial or discursive legacy that was, uh, that had been kind of withheld at a local level or that had been accumulated uh, from one edition to the next. And at this point, Eva hadn't even established an office for itself or had any organized archive of its past work beyond a shelf of catalogues. There was a sense that between the appointment of successive curators and the pro program frameworks that they would then develop, the organization was, was pretty invisible. And the way that these organizational deficits recycled from one edition to the next, ultimately, in my view, translated into a forecast of, of, of unsustainability. Uh, you know, the growth of the organization was mostly outwardly bound, you know, and, and this kind of itself coincided with the use of a more cultural destination lexicon in its promotional language, you know, its focus on the attendance of international visitors, and uh, perhaps more than ever, con consciously designing its communication explicitly within a bandwidth of international arts and lifestyle press. Essentially, it had become much more, a much more professional organization and much more kind of in keeping and comparable to other biannual projects of its scale. So we're now into the, the fourth phase, if you like. This is, um, I guess we could identify this as being the current phase um, since 2018, we have been uh, in a kind of luxury position of looking back at various versions of the organization at a point where, you know, in general, determinations of the future look increasingly uncertain. And, and the kind of future of the, 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 the BNL model even more so. There are a few things that we're now trying to work through as an organization evolving the kind of international biennial condition that we've we've we found ourselves in and firstly is simply just to explore the role the, the first thing we're doing is, is is just allowing ourselves to think through and explore the role that biennials can play in developing the art field in their respective regional contexts and not just in a programmatic sense so i guess i'm just really saying that we are allowing ourselves to think of ourselves more as uh, less like an event and more like an organization and more as uh, um, an organization that has permeations beyond the kind of event that we we deliver through through an exhibition program um, there is also a sense of wanting to like update and reconnect to this earlier mandate of being a, a generative organization for art and for artists rather than one that had gradually slipped into being driven to generate international visiting audiences. If you could go on to the next slide, please. Um, there's also the question that we that I mentioned previously and we, we've began to ask with increasing intensity as to whether the success of curatorial appointments over the past, past 40 years had kind of inadvertently set um, a pacemaker to either strategic and creative opportunities over the years and whether it in fact stemmed the organic growth of curatorial practice in Ireland more generally 
curating in the way that we um, invited into being was always something that was connected to somewhere else. So this, this, this kind of question of like, to what extent did that limit more, yeah, a more organic, uh, local, or regional growth in curatorial practice or in, in the horizons of opportunity for cur curatorial practice, you know, this became uh, a kind of uh, uh, a sort of growing concern. So we'd like to continue the shift um, from a less recessive and facilitatory platform for curators into a position where the appointment of curators represents and embodies an act of both hospitality and international co-development in terms that aren't just purely curatorial, but that could also invite and foster the accumulation of longer term organizational and infrastructural change. And this idea of like co-development in international work is important, I think, especially now that internationalism itself has been siege to neoliberalism and globalism and isn't any longer a measure of progressive values, if it ever was. In Ireland, on the western fringe of a small island, how we bestow new values in what it means to work internationally, you know, without opportunism, without cynicism, and towards an approach of mutual co-development with international partners seems uh, a really important and vital question. So the 39th EVA International is the first of a new and more modular program model that we've developed. And it's been the first opportunity really to sort of seed some of these, seed some of this thinking and seed some of the changes um, in approach that I've just talked about. And in this new program model, we have the appointment of a, of a curator is an appointment to develop one part of a three part framework. So we invited Istanbul uh, based curator Melva Veron to propose what we, um, what we called a guest program. And we invited her to extend her interests in, uh, in archives and the activation within a context here in Ireland that is still, as I've already suggested, still learning to look back at its own cultural histories over recent decades. And uh, Merv, Merv Alvaron's guest program was a program called Little Did They Know, and that took place across venues in Limerick and online in, 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 in uh, phase one, and will continue through other phases in two and three later this year. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the other change in our program model is that we replace the open call process um, with a dedicated commissions program for artists based in Ireland. It's still it's still an open process, um, but it focuses exclusively on new work and artists that are based in based in Ireland. And the ambition of this of this initiative is is um, is well it's not only to sort of pr prioritize uh, and sort of advance the horizons of opportunity for for artists that are based uh, based in Ireland but also to help build some of the infrastructural um, networks that are necessary for for you know am ambitious produ ambitious production you know Ireland still has a bit of a, a production capacity issue in terms of making work of scale or of um, of technical complexity or um, uh, or, or or work that that is um, cross disciplinary, for instance. So through this platform commissions initiative, it's it's an attempt to sort of seeds uh, and, and and create kind of new new horizons and new sort of paths of uh, of opportunity for artists that are based based in this country. And I guess the third part of that kind of modular biannual model that I've just um, just been talking about is a series of commissions, uh, commissioning partnerships uh, with other national and international organizations. And for the 39th Eve International, we have commissioned works by Emco M. Gupka with Irish Museum of Modern Art. Uh, we've also commissioned works uh, with Ola Barry, Anka Benera and Arnold Estefan. And we're going to be presenting these in phase two and three of the biannual this year. 
Um, due to the pandemic and its consequential obstacles to the work that we had planned, um, we made a decision to uh, deliver the 39th EVA International across three phases from um, um, 2020 and 2021. It was originally designed that EVA would all be delivered within a 10 week intensive program um, from September to November 2020. But we made a decision in, in April, May of 2020 that that wasn't really possible within our within our resource capacities and given the forecasts of um, of the pandemic, we made we made a call to um, uh, to to deliver the program in, in in three different phases. And you know the, the, this approach has actually been really very useful, uh, a very useful exercise in you know flexibly rescaling the organisation and you know, experimenting with different phased intensities. Um, and over the past year, I mean, we have certainly lost out in terms of international visitors, international press and international impact, but we've, we've really gained um, both in confidence and in understanding that, you know, maybe the sustainability and the futurity of the organization is a lot less dependent on the BNL model than we'd previously thought. Um, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thanks, so, thanks so much, Matt. Um, uh, great presentation. And actually, I just realized that um, that Eva is, is actually the oldest of the Biennales, which will be discussed uh, today. So it's very interesting to to maybe even reflect upon uh, the question of deficit, which is a word that you brought up in relation to 1977 and what particular deficits were specific to the Irish context that's both enabled and necessitated uh, the emergence of, of, of Eva. But also, I think uh, I'm grateful for you to for giving uh, um, a very short, but maybe perhaps even succinct um, uh, history of uh, the globalization of, of, of contemporary art uh, within an Irish context, but also within an international context and how interrelated those histories are with the history of curating and a very particular model of curating, therefore, you know, the model of curating being bringing in the outside expert specialists from somewhere else to to reflect upon uh, the state of contemporary art internationally, but also it's situated within the, the local or national context, such as such as Ireland. And maybe this is something that we can also reflect upon in the future. But um, thanks so much for the talk and uh, presentation. And uh, we'll we'll have a chat uh, in a little while. Thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, I want to introduce my thanks, Matt. Uh, I'd like to introduce our second uh, presenter, our second speaker of today of this evening, uh, Helsinki time, Eastern European time, and that is uh, Marty Manon. Welcome uh, to uh, our talk series this evening, Matt Marty. I uh, hope you're well. Uh, Marty is the director of Index, which is the Swedish Contemporary Art Foundation in Stockholm. Um, he has curated many, many exhibitions uh, across the world, um, including at uh, the Musée de Historia Natural in Mexico City, Ara in Bangkok, Sala Recalda in Bilbao, Constalce in Stockholm, uh, CS2M in uh, Madrid, in Fundacio Miro in Barcelona. Uh, Marty has curated a Spanish pavilion in uh, the 2015 Venice uh, Biennale, so not uh, unfamiliar to um, to curating um, in uh, many multiple um, biennial Biennale contexts. Uh, Marty has also curated Momentum 10, as I mentioned earlier, which was the uh, the, the first Nordic Biennial or so-called Nordic Biennial uh, and which is uh, which took place in Moss uh, in Norway in 2019, so uh, just over two years ago now. Uh, but in the 1990s, Marty was uh, very well known for curating five years of exhibitions in his room, located in his student flat, um, and he has published many books um, and contributed many 
texts and essays to very important um, publications um, over the last uh, 20 to 30 years now. And I'm delighted to to um, invite Marty to take the stage now, who will uh, look at momentum and also maybe reflect a little bit on the Nordic context. Welcome, Marty. Nice to see you, as always. Thanks, Paul, and thanks a lot for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here talking with you. Thanks, of course, to, to Helsinki Biennial and uh, fantastic to talk after Matt to get this overview on the construction of a biennial, uh, something that happens not just during the time it's open, but all, all during all this, this process. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, momentum. Uh, momentum 10, specifically. Momentum is this biennial that started in... Uh, 1998 uh, in Moss. And to contextualize, Moss is a small town, uh, 40 minutes by train from Oslo, and uh, with around 50,000 inhabitants. In this spot, uh, some people decided to start something that uh, later became a, a biennial. Mm, this 40 minutes distance from, from uh, Oslo uh, defines also what most is as a, as a town. You know, it's, it's a place that you can, you can get a cheaper um, and bigger house than in Oslo, but you can still have a life in Oslo. At the same time that it has a, its own identity. They are kind of proud of the fact that uh, Edward Munch was, having, uh, was spending uh, holidays there. But there was also the industrial part of, of the city that defined also the idea of, 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 of Moss. There was this paper mill that also uh, invited to visitors with this special uh, smell coming from, from a paper mill. So Moss has this direct uh, effect on visitors or, or has this direct effect through, through this industrial side of, of the city. Mm. As I said, I'm going to talk about Momentum 10, this edition I created. Uh, uh, and for me, it was an important uh, moment to reflect. It was the 10th edition, it's a special number, and my proposal was to, to stop and to think and to look back at the history of the biennial relationship to a local context. And as uh, Paul said, uh, it's interesting also to point out that in this case, the local context, it's a, a multiple idea. We're talking about Moss, we're talking about Norway, but the biennial has in its her name this uh, concept of Nordic. And Nordic is something that has been changing, of course, for the last 20 years. It's not the same thing to talk about the uh, Nordicness in 98 than in 2006 or in 2017. This process that we have been uh, seeing on uh, from the universalism to, to globalization to liberalism and to terror uh, has been affecting also this, this uh, pan-national idea that it's there with this concept of the Nordic. The Nordic is an extremely flexible word. Uh, no one knows exactly what this thing means. Uh, there's more almost an ideology or a romantic uh, religious approach to it that it's used in politics in uh, some cases. But uh, it's difficult to find someone reclaiming this concept as the first uh, definition of uh, the identity of this person or this uh, element. What's interesting also, to go back to this name, is that uh, it's connected to the moment where the, this biennial started. In, uh, it's 98. 98 is the time when uh, something happens in some countries, in, the, in Scandinavian, in the Nordic uh, region, and there's this uh, sentence talking about this Nordic miracle. And many uh, artists from the, this, the region suddenly uh, uh, are getting a lot of international uh, recognition. Politically, there are some things that are also uh, showing a desire to have a sort of common view. Uh, there's NIFCA helping on the, the international distribution of the arts. Um, there's the new magazine, this publication that has also this, this uh, international uh, approach on its definition on how to present a Nordic or art from the Nordic countries. So there's a, there's a context that uh, leads uh, uh, most to define this biennial as something Nordic. But it's, it's going to affect its uh, DNA. Uh, and it's a biennial that's going to be changing during the time. So first, what we consider it's uh, just uh, artists from the Nordic region, but uh, slowly, uh, the process is going to be 
uh, showing more presence of artists from everywhere. Also, the idea of what a Nordic artist is is going to change, because probably many artists that are living in Berlin are more Nordic than uh, other artists living in, in Oslo, because they have an, a network that is based on this connection with other artists from, from the region. But also the 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 fact that the world uh, uh, is organizing another system with another type of mobility, with uh, with another type of uh, process uh, related to living situations, uh, define the Nordic as, a, as something that it's probably difficult to grasp as as uh, as an idea, as a closed idea. But what was important for me, and also connecting with uh, with Matt uh, uh, presentation of of. Uh, Eva, it was to, to understand uh, the fact that this biennial uh, uh, was affecting a place. It has a, a relation with the context, and the context it was probably more specific than the, this Nordic idea. And we are talking about Moss, about this uh, town uh, that has been receiving art and contemporary art and contemporary art experiences for more than 20 years in the form of a biennial. It was a uh, history behind with F15, this uh, gallery, this art center that has been very important for the history of, the, of Norwegian art. Uh, but still, uh, the biennial was something received on a local level. And, I, and for me, it was interesting to observe this thing, how, how some uh, memories uh, remain on place. Not necessarily artworks, but memories. So I wanted to, to start this, uh, this uh, connection with my, my work there as a curator, just doing some historical research, but uh, doing it uh, wrong. So together with uh, Anne Klons, who was an assistant curator, we were uh, talking with a lot of people locally. So just meeting people there in Moss, uh, uh, talking also with installers, people who, who had been installing at the, the, the exhibitions uh, during the, the years, and of course talking with uh, uh, previous curators. And we decided to gather a lot of information uh, based on the emotional content to a situation like, uh, such as a biennial. What do we remember? What was important? What was affecting us as people? Uh, what's uh, still in town of uh, these uh, uh, artistic experiences that have been there? And it's extremely interesting to see that uh, some artworks remain, of course, as a narrative. It's not necessary to see them. It's not necessary to have them with you, but they have been defining the behavior of many people in relationship to arts. And it can be an artwork or it can be trouble. Some things that were impossible to do in the history of Momento uh, remain as, uh, as a memory, as a really a life memory. Like uh, when there was a public debate uh, make it impossible to produce an artwork, this, this debate uh, uh, was also part of the biennial. If we observe it from an historical perspective, understanding that, uh, that this uh, emotional contact will uh, offer a type of narrative related to, to historiography. So what we did was to gather all this material, having in mind the fact that uh, we were going to do a biennial something that was going to happen in present time. But because uh, what's interesting also for me, at least with this format, with the biennial, that it's something that it's still uh, challenging and still in process of definition, what's uh, after more than 100 years, is that uh, as, a, as a format, you can work with it on a, with a flexible way. And you can do things and you can play with the temporalities as we can see in many, many cases. But we wanted to have a, an exhibition happening for you as a visitor. We want this idea of present time. So we were observing history with the goal not to present history as something that is far from you. We want to connect history with the present time. And it was affecting the way we were uh, doing our research on the, the past of the biennial, but also how we were looking at art. Mm. We're talking about a small, mid-sized biennial. It's about 30 artists. Uh, and in, in the case of uh, Momentum 10, we had three sites. So a big industrial uh, building, uh, a villa, a house that is F15, this uh, gallery uh, in the countryside, and then one amazing library, a uh, bookshop that is in the middle of, of the town, uh, the House of Foundation. So we have three different spots 
two of them quite close to each other. The other one you need to transport to, to go there because it's uh, yeah outside the, the center. We had also some other uh, spots for, for specific artworks, so it was important also to look at the space to see what uh, artists could be uh, doing there uh, to define like other temporalities, uh, and it was also important for us. But during this research, this, uh, this previous moment of, uh, of uh, approach to uh, contact with Avayenel, as I said, we were like interviewing previous curators, and what we did was to, to publish uh, a book, this one. It's a uh, 350 pages with uh, with interviews uh, with previous creators, and it is extremely interesting because as uh, as you are talking with people that are not selling their exhibition, uh, you can get all the trouble, and you can get all the questions, all the doubts, all the problems uh, while installing something. Uh, all the discussions, and, and I think it's extremely generous for from all the previous creators to to share it with us. So what was happening in in, in the second edition in 2000 in terms of like stress? What was happening in 2004 uh, with the discussion with the politicians? And it's like now it's extremely important as learning material to offer also this this other point of view uh, that uh, that won't remain if we are not able to write it down. Because this is not the, the history of a successful uh, situation. It's the history of a process uh, that defines the relationship with a space, a town, uh, some people. And, uh, and it's presented in this case in more as a learning situation for, um, for everyone. And I think it's very important to see, to look at these, uh, at these uh, memories also from a distance. Of course, when you are interviewing someone uh, about a project that this uh, uh, person was doing 20 years ago, what you're getting is fragments. You're getting uh, moments, you're getting like uh, flashes that remain there in a weird way in some cases. And it's interesting to see and to ask ourselves why these memories. Because then it's extremely connected to art, to the artistic experience, how we visit exhibitions and how we feel things when, uh, when these things are happening. Right. So for me, it was important to, to start first with this uh, background to, to create together with Anne Clons, uh, uh, was I think also this book, the, this, this uh, framework of uh, uh, historical uh, perspective on the idea of the biennial itself. So how to define what's a biennial, what's Nordic, what has been Nordic during all this time, uh, how artists have been working, what was possible to produce, what happens when uh, when you have opened an exhibition like a biennial, is it possible to do events or not? Are you too tired to do things after two weeks? So there are many, many questions there that are uh, uh, related to the machine itself, but that connected to a curatorial approach as well. So from this, this uh, historical uh, approach and framework, uh, then it was possible to, to think more on how to do the exhibition, how to produce something new and to be able to show it to, to the same citizens. And in this case, what's interesting as well is that, you know, as a curator, uh, you have to be extremely humble because you will have visitors from this town that know much more than you what has been present, what has been going on there. Uh, I can be the visitor of uh, some mm -hmm. uh, editions of the biennial, but I'm not living there. So uh, they know uh, all the, the previews, the moments that, that have been like affecting the decisions. They know the, the politicians and they know how, how the society is organized. So it's important also to, to understand that uh, visitors, uh, the local visitors are extremely important and they are like a source of information. Um, during this process, we could uh, see that part of the archive was missing. For example, there was this float and some documents were on water. And then uh, uh, from the organization of the, of the Bayani, that's a really incredible machine. It, it works really, really well as, a, as an organization. Uh, they could get information to, to bring the, the archive back. And the information came from citizens that had images of some artworks. Uh, and it was a good way also to understand how in exhibitions were installed. Uh, because it was like the, the gaze from the users there that uh, suddenly were becoming the, the, the voices from the archive, right? So for me, it was also important to understand these kind of processes, what was going on, 
to to be able to to offer content from this this specific local context that has an international desire as well because it's also important uh, for them on a local level to understand that this moment this uh, biennial uh, it's a it's a, a situation where to be in contact with art but also to be in contact with other people uh, we were there installing for a long period of time i was like going back and forth a lot of many, many times, and, and meeting a lot of people, and also meeting people in the region, meeting people at the university that's close to them, meeting people at the university in Oslo to organize some research processes together regarding the idea of the biennial. So it's, it's, it's also a way to, to keep some kind of continuity while an exhibition is in, it's, it's, uh, defined. But as I said, this, this, uh, this is a frame. Then what happens is that uh, we also wanted to play this idea of historicity within the exhibition, but uh, not uh, doing an exhibition based on the archive. The archive is possible and it's amazing. We wanted to do something that was also mm, exhibitional on a more traditional way, if you want. Uh, like you visit a biennial, you know that you will find some artworks, bigger or smaller, but some things that are uh, yeah, more or less experimental, but that, that want to, to get your attention somehow. What we did was to first to decide that 50% of the, of the uh, participant artists would be artists that uh, uh, will be new for most, uh, but the other ones will be artists that have been already at the Biennial with some of artworks uh, in, in several of the, of the editions that uh, have been happening. And the uh, selection was also based on this idea of what's, uh, what remains as well, what's, what's important, what, what do we have in our memories on, what, on these, these specific times. What was interesting for me also was to find other uh, systems to, to go back to some artworks, uh, not necessarily with a melancholic approach, but to reformulate the relationship with the present time. Uh, some examples. Uh, in 98, the first edition, there was this, this um, uh, installation by Eyalis Attila, uh, Today, it's called, it's the title of the, of the piece. It's a yeah, quite advanced uh, installation for, for 98. Uh, it was at this moment fast, uh, a deconstructed film in three screens, uh, presented through the voice and uh, image of three characters. Uh, what happens when you take this piece and present it now? Is it the same piece or not? And in this case, what what uh, was happening was that uh, uh, we were presenting a remastered version of the work. Still the same piece, but you have a digital digital touch on the on image. It's interesting to observe in this case that suddenly this is a slow piece, something that before was uh, fast. Uh, Twenty years later, uh, it has another temporality on the way it's constructed on editing. But uh, but it was this this idea in this case. Like the, let's let's uh, present this new version of this uh, installation that is uh, uh, adapted to the the style, the graphic style, let's say, of uh, present times. Not uh, edited on a, uh, not the, the the construction of the of the film, but the, the the mood, the colors of the film. With Annika Larson, we did exactly the opposite. So we were presenting a piece from her from 2000, uh, 2015. And what we decided in this case was to present it as it was like back then, because Annika Larson is an artist that uh, was working a lot with uh, the texture of film, of video. Uh, so the, in, for her production, uh, in the, to, re to present again this film, the important thing was to find an old projector. New projectors have uh, other type of color than the one that was uh, used in 2000, other type of pixels, like uh, you see uh, images differently. What happens when suddenly in the middle of this new situation that is uh, the Momentum 10 and a uh, new uh, biennial, you feel that you, have, you are watching at a film and this film has a patina that comes from the past. Is it something happening at this moment or is it something that happened before? Because you are watching the film. But technologically, there's something uh, wrong. But it's extremely right because the piece was uh, meant to be presented in this type of projection. So there were like suddenly that, like possible discussions and dialogues between artworks uh, based on other temporalities. And at the same time, you know, it's not that we were just presenting these pieces. In between these works, we have 
new uh, productions that are uh, commissioned to be done at, uh, at, mo at Momentum 10. But I'm, I'm more focusing now in these this, uh, uh, games, if you want, uh, based on history, like how to, how to reformulate some processes and how to understand uh, the work of the artists. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, in the, a piece by Saskia Holmquist uh, that was presented in 2009, uh, the edition of 2009, a video called uh, Blight Understanding. And 20, yeah, 20, oh, uh, 10 years later, uh, Saskia, uh, the artist, she's not, she uh, doesn't agree with the work. The work was talking about migration, was talking about a, a, a globalized world in a terminology that is from 2009. How to present a piece uh, uh, from an artist uh, when this artist uh, says that, look, I, I think that uh, what I was doing back then, it's not okay to be seen today. So what we did with Saskia Holmquist was to, to put an extra layer at the film. So there was a new voiceover commenting the work from the past and being critical with what uh, she was thinking back then. And it's something that, for, that sadly for me is very, very interesting. It's like an artist can't comment this kind of uh, work from before. The work is not stopped. The work can be reconstructed now with the approach from today. It means that, uh, that art is re reacting and the artist is also reacting to, to, a per to, to the, the present time. And that is this desire to analyze something from the past, but also having this uh, engage from today. And for me, it was, a, it was, a, was a really good exercise. Like, okay, what does it mean to bring back this piece? That suddenly you have to produce this piece again. This piece must be a new one to be adapted to a context, to be adapted to reality today. Because, uh, yeah, just something as simple as uh, the use of some vocabulary can be extremely wrong. If you want to do an exhibition that is based in present time, if you want to do a dialogue that happens on the exhibition room with a visitor that is now, if you don't want to have this distance that is uh, coming from an historical approach. But it's also, uh, at the beginning, it's also our addition of a Bayern is also a good moment to bring back some, some things that probably uh, were almost invisible in other editions, but you think are important. Uh, with Johanna Billing, we did two things. We presented a new piece, and then it's also another interesting gesture, like what does it mean to present a new work of an artist that has been twice at this biennial before, uh, what kind of, of, of uh, process uh, can be followed locally, like because uh, Suddenly, the, the uh, citizens in Moss, they have seen uh, the work by Johanna Billing three times. So they know quite a lot of these artists if they have been following it. Uh, uh, and then it's, it's, it's interesting that, that there's another type of relationship. It's uh, on an art critic level, uh, this uh, regular citizen has quite a lot to say. In 2000, uh, Joanna Billing was presenting a piece, but also working with a project that was called the uh, Make It Happen Tour. Um, and they organized a, a tour with musicians and, uh, and, and performers to, coming by bus from Stockholm to, to Moss to do a, a festival. What happened back then in 2000 is that the curators were really tired and, uh, and everyone was really, really tired. And the festival wasn't happening during the opening. It happened like one month later. No one was attending to the festival. Uh, no one was uh, informing about the festival. The creators were not there, for example, or part of the, uh, the cultural team uh, couldn't be like following this, this, this project. When they arrived in town, they got information like, maybe you can go to, to Oslo to give some flyers to people so people can come here. And they did it. They did this festival alone. So we have a bunch of artists and musicians doing a festival uh, with almost no audience. But they are documenting it. There are some films. So what, uh, what we wanted to do uh, now in 2019 was to present this documentation, to observe what was happening, that this, this emotional situation that was happening back then with this uh, answer from the art saying, you know, we are going to do it. And it's happening now, but through this documentation, we can see it again, and we can see some kind of energy that was in this, in this situation. 
but sometimes it's uh, it makes no sense to present artworks the, uh, out of time okay uh, and it was one of the cases one of the memories the strongest memories in in uh, moss and it's uh, something that uh, we observe not just from the professionals but also for with many people in in town is one piece by Ola Flor Eliasson so Ola Flor Eliasson in 98 was uh, uh, affecting on the water of the river that it's in the middle of, of town. Suddenly the river was green, like really, really yeah, electric green. This is a piece that he ha was doing in all other um, locations, but it was also happening there in, in Moss. And it's uh, clearly alive as a piece, but again, as a narrative. The idea that, that something crazy happened and the river was green. But uh, we were talking with with all of Elias to see it, if it to think together, all of us with the team and, uh, and his team as well, to think if it makes sense to present this work now. And the result was a, a no, like it makes no sense. This is another type of context. And uh, and he was uh, talking also about uh, that what happens after uh, 2011, what happens when uh, there's this uh, idea of terror? What happens when there has been uh, a, a attack in, in Norway? Is it okay to, to use a, a, a chemical product and put it on water? It's not, a, it's not dangerous, but it has an image of danger suddenly. What was something that was not uh, perceived as danger, it could be dangerous today. So what we decided to do was to just talk about it. Talk about the fact that some things uh, are more uh, sensitive than what we can think, and that we need to reconsider our work and sometimes decide to stop and not to do things because uh, because it can be uh, affected by the, mm, the timing of its presentation. So it was interesting to see, to see that uh, we were like working with several artists, we were defining several ways of working and, uh, and it was important as in any curatorial process to be aware and to listen and to find systems of presentation that uh, could be interesting, not just for the artists, but for the visitors. There are a lot of things to say uh, at the end. And we also know that uh, at Biennial has some visitors, but uh, the, it's important to keep an idea of visiting. So after the 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 reader, we did the viewer that was published after the, the the biennial. And in this case, we wanted something as almost as a magazine. Like you have this feeling of you are visiting something, and the curatorial text in this case is a, it's a, almost a fi it's a fiction. It's a fiction with uh, two people visiting the biennial to get also this emotional approach or or the feeling that you are around and visiting one exhibition. Um, it's about uh, the past, it's about how to work with history, but it's also about how to project some things to, to the future, how to make uh, some things remain uh, through memories, through the emotional, or but also through ideas and, and artworks. And I think that it has been 20 minutes now, Paul. Uh, thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Marty. And, um, uh, there are a number of things that obviously came up in your presentation, um, specifically around um, uh, the terminology uh, related to, to momentum, such as uh, Nordic art and what, um, what defines Nordic art now, but also what defines uh, art when specific to a particular region, uh, ge ge geopolitical territory. Uh, I think it's also interesting to think that uh, one of the very few pavilions that is shared in the Venice Biennale is also the Nordic pavilion shared between Sweden, Norway and Finland. So it seems to be uh, particular to the, the relationship between those particular states, certainly within an international uh, biennial context such as, such as Venice. But I think it's also maybe something to reflect on further uh, defining um, the relationship between contemporary art and nationalism and how, how awkward, difficult and uh, perhaps perhaps pertinent that might also be currently with the rise of um, neo-nationalism and, and uh, protectionism uh, post-pandemic, but also pre-pandemic pre for any of us who've been uh, looking at 
how global globalism as an idea for contemporary art has been heavily critiqued uh, by this kind of populist agenda, culture in generally uh, being critiqued by this populist agenda. But also, uh, uh, thank you for bringing up the idea of the me of memory and, and artworks as narrative. I think that's also something maybe we could reflect on later, the idea of uh, place or location uh, developing its identity in relation to the production and commissioning and its relationship with artworks that are realized specific to, to locations, which I think is also um, something which has emerged very specifically uh, within the, uh, the in parallel to the development of, of biennials uh, since the 1990s, uh, where despite specificity and location specific works were very much reflecting on where the works were, were being experienced and where the works were being produced. But thanks, Marty, and um, we will come back to, to some of those uh, issues maybe uh, a little bit later on. Um, but uh, thank you. And uh, now for our third um, speakers of this evening, um, I'm delighted to invite uh, uh, two of the members of Rox Media Collective, uh, Monica Narula and Jibesh Bagshi. Um, who together with uh, Shibrata Zengupta uh, formed uh, Rocks Media Collective in 1992 in Delhi, in India. And for those of us who have um, a fondness for, uh, for, for texts and for, for the relationship between uh, textual production and curatorial work, um, Rocks have been a very important um, um, collective engaging with the interrelationship between knowledge production and uh, curatorial practice. But the word rocks um, in several languages donates or denotes uh, an, intens an intensification or an awareness and presence attaining to whirling, turning, being in a state of revolution. Rocks Media Collective take this sense uh, to mean kinetic contemplation and a restless entanglement with the world and with time. Uh, they have enlisted objects such as early modern tiger automata from southern India or a biscuit from uh, the Paris Commune or a cup salvage from an ancient Mediterranean shipwreck to turn them into devices to stiff and to taste time. Devices are often uh, deployed thus in order to undertake historical subterfuge and philosophical queries. Uh, Rock's practices have uh, taken on several media, installation, sculpture, video, performance, text, lexica, curation. As I've said, they're very transdisciplinary, but very much invested in the kind of production of knowledge as well, or alongside uh, practice and working together with curators and artists. The members of Rock's Media Collective, they live and work in Delhi, and I think that's also very particular to their approach to uh, globalism, but also our approach to internationalism, working very locally, will also uh, very much engage with the with the global context of contemporary art and uh, its political ramifications. Uh, in two thousand and one, um, they co-founded the Surrey uh, program at CSDS in New Delhi and ran it for a decade, uh, producing many incredible publications uh, as part of the the Surrey uh, Reader Series. And they participated as artists or as an artist collective in numerous biennales and major international exhibitions across the war world. Um, over the last uh, 30 years or so, they are, have been curators of the 11th Shanghai Biennale uh, from 2016 to 2017, which they may uh, reflect on a little bit um, as part of their presentation, which was called Why Not Ask Again? And they are most recently, um, uh, were most recently um, the artistic directors for the recently concluded Yokohama Triennale in uh, 2020 called Afterglow, uh, where they develop sources uh, such as or around uh, and engage with issues such as care, toxicity, luminosity of friendship and so forth. So welcome, uh, Monica and Shibesh, and um, looking forward to, uh, to to talking with you later. Sure. Uh, thanks, Paul. Thank you for inviting us tonight. Um, so we look forward to talking with you. Uh, I've enjoyed listening to the other speakers and to having this conversation expand over the course of the conversation that follows.
So today what we thought we'd do is we would sort of lay out some of the ideas behind the Yokohama Triennial, not so much um, of the exhibition and a quiet exhibition, but more, I think, sort of um, trying to postulate for you all um, how we see the sort of conceptual formulation of what a biennial or a triennial can be and how is one to look at it um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a creature that repeats uh, and yet is unique each time. So there are some postulations that will emerge. Um, but as you know, uh, well, as you've already mentioned, Yokohama Triennial actually took place last year in the middle of the pandemic. Um, as a matter of fact, it opened on the 17th of July um, at a time when there was no global movement at all. Uh, and we personally did not go and install the exhibition. We did not actually see the exhibition um, as an experience. We didn't, uh, we didn't actually walk through the building buildings, I should say, there's the Yokohama Museum of Art, and there was another building, uh, Plot 48, which was about five minutes walk away. Um, but what, what was interesting, I think we've all um, experienced this, is the fact that the pandemic, the moment of this global disruption, was a kind of a site of instability in motion, even though it was a site of a time of, um, uh, yeah, can we go to the next slide, please? Um, even though it was a time of stillness, it was also a time of uh, motion of, like I said, instability in motion. And I hear, um, you could see the work of Joyce Ho, which was installed at Plot 48, where what seems like a, a fencing cutting across the space, you can actually push it and it shakes. It does become a, a, a line that seems uh, uh, harsh, but it, it, it's, it's a moving line. You can make it move. You can push it into motion. But anyway, um, what it, what we all I think experienced definitely was that was that the the pandemic became a time where um, the sort of mental map I suppose from point A to point B to point N to point N plus one um, that temporal logic was one of um, was one outside description. It could it could not we could not quite narrate the experience of the pandemic. I think this is going to be one of the things that's going to emerge over the years, how the pandemic will get narrated, uh, not so much in terms of global events and or, you know, uh, the, the sort of uh, stoppages and the bigger markers of, of, the, of, of the pandemic, which we all sort of know, but how is this time um, going to affect and change the inner workings and therefore the leakages and porosities that will emerge from, from this time? Um, both both a sensorial and intimate time, besides, of course, it being a, a global kind of simultaneity of an experience. Um, but I think that we would agree that it calls for a reapprehending of the world. Next slide. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a reapprehending of the world, of its dimension, of its structures, and of its futurity. The work that you see here is a piece by Ivana Franke. This is the on, on the Yokohama Museum of Art. Her work clads the entire museum. Next slide. It uh, transforms uh, what looks like uh, what is an important 80 sort of uh, important architectural, quite a heavy building Next slide is a view. Uh, into something that as you walk along, walk by it, walk along it, it seems to shimmer and uh, become evanescent and it seems to feel uh, unstable. It seems to be a, a large space that seems to have not any kind of fixity. Um, yeah. So as you can see, this um, this piece, uh, it, you know, some people call it like the, as if the building wore a summer kimono, uh, which was kind of opposite considering the time. But as you can see from the experience of even the video, it becomes um, a zone of um, fluctuation. It becomes a, 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 a temporal experience sort of mapped onto a, a, a spatial, a, a physical structure. And I want to just uh, briefly read here from uh, what we wrote. Um, actually, I can't, but anyway, okay. let's carry on. Okay. Okay. Let's go to the next slide, please. So one of the questions that uh, came uh, during the research of the Biennale. And Biennales and Triennales are a site where the transglobal conversation condenses and transglobal conversations are enacted very profoundly. 
So the, this reapprehending sense is actually a subliminal current that keeps on going and subterraneanly shaping the way of making of a conversation between the artist and the curatorial practice that surrounds a Biennale. I, I would say not a curatorial uh, uh, personalities, but curatorial team. It's 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 kind of is a becomes much more porous, much more bigger conversation. So the if you uh, if you have the next slide, please. Uh, so what we have is that uh, I'll just tell you the, uh, through the work of Asako Awama. She is from a she. It's a it's a very simple. It's one of the earliest work that we got excited by, and then slowly took time over two years to shape it. And that's one of the finest thing about a triennale is that you get two years for a work to shape. Is that this idea of a very intimate world of a relationship with the father creates a very interesting perimeter, a geography. That keeps on growing, and what we find is we enter the world of late 60s and early 70s of hunger, food, and famines, and also the most crucially, the story of a, dip bio, a different kind of biological idea of plants and uh, plants and fauna. So, what the hand of our uh, uh, Asako is basically leading us to a deep current of history. And that history, that this this movement between this uh, uh, hand and the history, is what actually a certain something that we have started now calling the intimacies of scale, in which the perimeter of the personal keeps on moving with a very high degree of velocity and taking into a huge, like the photographs, large part of it's in the archives in Europe, and so it, what happens is different perimeters. So a small little prefectory in Japan. Up a uh, child growing up there, actually, when she unravels, she unravels the whole part of the world. That's the transglobal aspect of it. And the second, uh, next slide, please. And the second work that we want to quickly touch is Amol Patil's. Is he's from Bombay, and here the work is touching on a on a certain thread, the persistent thread of a kind of a Im complete inability. Of a civilization to deal with toxicity, and the horror it creates in his inability to deal with toxicity. So, for Amol, simple gestures of a shirt, a hand, uh, it creates an incredible possibility to go into a civilizational dialogue. So here he is able to recall two thousand years of history. So this is what the transglobal movement, what we call in the Biennale or Triennale, these conversations between different circuits, different kind of range of the historical time horizons or the civilizational time horizon. Next slide, please. Um, so bridging from that, I mean, you know, um, Paul said that, we, you know, we, we worked on sources and on the ideas of toxicity. So basically, we were actually already thinking, you know, like with Amol's work and, and as ideas that we have written in an essay some uh, in 2016, I think where we were talking about the question of um, of toxicity in 2017, the question of toxicity, how it is part of the everyday, uh, how it is impossible to circumvent it. But the question is, can one even do so? The question then becomes, how does one live with toxicity, right? Um, we can, you know... Uh, Next slide. Yeah, so basically the question of toxicity is also one of care and repair. When you live with it, how do you care for that which is both uh, touched by it in the negative and by which and also how do you repair that which has been touched by it? Next. Um, and this is the work of the collective Make or Break based in Australia. And their piece for the triennial was a rendering of the bridges of Yokohama, uh, which has many bridges, especially the old part of the city. Uh, they Next. rendered them as uh, metal, as iron sculptures. And as you um, participated in the work, you could spray salt water, the sea, in a sense, uh, the very environment, the very atmosphere of a town like Yokohama, and how its its very its very nature is a corrosive nature. So you can participate in the corrosion of the, of the bridges, but also, in a way, you can watch them with a kind of tenderness, uh, how they transform themselves but at the same time take care of you and you have to figure out ways of repairing them as time passes. Um, and the next slide, please, is the work of Masaru Iwai. Masaru is an artist whom we also met pretty early on in our conversations in Yokohama. And he is someone who 
actually worked, he signed up to work um, in the cleaning teams of Next Fukushima uh, after the Fukushima disaster of which we are, you know, we are just at the 10 year mark. Um, and he, uh, he told us and you know, we saw pictures of the kind of the, the great amount of care that people were doing in sort of in, in picking up every weed, in cleaning the street, the soil. Um, but what is interesting, of course, is that these things were then kept in plastic bags and then buried, which of course raises other questions of leakage and so on. But the care with which he, as a worker, as a kind of uh, as a volunteer worker, was 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 doing, uh, he wanted Excellent. to bring that as a as an ethos. And we talked about that as an ethos. And he developed this piece where he invited people. You could you know you could um, um, ask. You could write write to him. He would send you this brown paper bag mask, which he had uh, marked on it with uh, graphite, with pencil graphite, which is also material used in nuclear reactors to keep them cool. Um, keep the radioactivity contained. Yeah, to keep the radioactivity contained, sorry. Um, and uh, each, in any, you know, people could modify the masks, transform them into uh, this kind of headpieces that could, that were what, well, it was it open that question that images of the self and how one part, but the crucial thing was that after that they would participate in actions of cleaning, cleaning of the street sometimes, wherever they wanted, in the house, in the school, in the street, in offices. Uh, and it became a fascinating kind of uh, Instagram uh, experience as well because hundreds of these pictures began to show up under the hashtag Boomstars. Next. Next. So I think through this, um, we sort of um, began the conversation of thinking on the question of how does one then locate in the context of, 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 this, uh, of, this, of this landscape of care and repair, the idea of the body itself and care in, in that sort of much more intimate scale. This is a piece by Kei Takamura, who um, uh, had an installation which had many of these objects that she had wrapped and then stitched some which were broken and were held together by fabric and she Next used this voluminous silk which glowed in the dark this is a performance that she would sporadically part like do herself as well she would appear unannounced in the museum and and keep stitching um, the fabric at the back or stitching um, objects that were broken but it became kind of this unpredictable piece where you did not know what care would bring out the next time you went back to the museum and what was by the use of the luminous, the bioluminous silk, um, which also we were connecting to ideas of luminosity of, of uh, friendship and and um, and also to the luminosity that uh, has been in the research uh, of uh, through jellyfish that Oka, Oka, what's his name? Shimamura San had done and got, won the Nobel Prize for, which is also around the question of luminosity. But I will not digress now. I'll focus on this question of uh, of how Next how to image. reposition body and care um, in the context of some of these ideas that we were uh, asking uh, and which were emerging in dialogue with artists. What you see is a video from, uh, from a film, Jolly Dovena, which is Those Who Do Not Drown. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a story, a love story actually between someone who is fading away and someone who's trying to keep that fading away from not fading away. So there is a pressure. So now what is interesting is all the work that you are seeing are done and commissioned and worked on way before the pandemic hit. So and this work now, which was just showing in Delhi, became a like everybody was seeing it and saying, oh, what a great pandemic work. But it was not made during the pandemic. Rather, it was obstructed by the pandemic in the final realization of the work. But what is interesting, the question of toxicity and question of how we live with it, question of the care that one has to give to the world that is fading away and dealing with toxicity and the world that has to make sense of it and recoup it and then again live with it. So this re living with and understanding the fading away. This is what the, the kernel of much of the repositioning of the body and care uh, around toxicity and friendship that we were trying to uh, understand. And this was way before 
and uh, way before the world. Uh, so it become now a part of a general conversation. Speaking now, it looks like it has been retrofitted. We were asked many times whether it was retrofitted, but actually, it's very weirdly, this was a commission in long time back, about a year back before the pandemic hit. But the question that means that is what Vantashira we call it, the subterranean a feeling that the world had, and feeling that we were not only we were having, but many artists we shared with, and we are a small fragment, probably a microsome of many conversations in the world, that there was something up for repair, care, was up for a rethinking that which suddenly with the pandemic has come in surface and manifested itself. Next. Yeah, actually, this is this little fragment that I wanted to read earlier, which I couldn't find again, uh, which we had written uh, when the uh, when the exhibition was beginning to open. This is also part of the wall text. It said, meanwhile, in the course of a few months, a tiny virus, an unliving being, emerged, upending assumptions and being a task to the entire species. For the first time in human history, we, all the billions from all the parts of the world, have to undertake in awareness of each other the remaking of forms of life. It has brought to the foreground the necessity of reapprehending the world. We are now in the afterglow of an unfamiliar, viral, and partly unreadable time and are without familiar protocols. I think this question of what is it when you don't have the protocols that you uh, have taken for granted, and I think the question of um, uh, taken for grantedness is an interesting one. It's not just the question that the pandemic has shifted protocols which of course is what I'm what we are referring to here. But I think what Jibesh is talking about is that we we have to take into cognizance that some of the assumed protocols are also problematic, right? So as as and, and artists are often pointing to that, touching upon that, um, uh, unlayering that, uh, you know, uncovering that, that but protocols cannot and should not be taken for granted. We have to keep looking for um, new ways of apprehending and reapprehending the world. But in that, on that tone, we should note, on that note, go to the off-human and the of-human to connect back to this. The next slide, please. Uh, th this is a work by Zengbo. So here, actually, before we talk about the specifics of the work, the, the, what we wanted to talk about, and I think this is something that many of us are now more and more attentive to, is the relationship that is of the human and that is off of the human, right? And so this, uh, it's a clever wordplay, but basically it does point to the fact that there is a, like, the, the, the network that we live with, the surroundings that we are, are part of, the ecology that we keep calling ecology is a much more nuanced and um, an unpredictable one. Uh, and I think this is kind of a fact by now, but what is interesting about say, someone like Jango's work is that he pushes that envelope. So when you look at the, the piece, what you will encounter is, a, is an erotic encounter. What you will encounter is an erotic encounter between, uh, between the human and, and plants. So this is not bestiality as it has been understood or banned. This is not an idea of erotics uh, that takes, you know, that like takes from any that. train, uh, you know, from terms that we are familiar with. But what it does do is it takes the idea of queerness and sort of extends the fabric into uh, a relationship, an erotic relationship with the plants. Next slide, please. And it was coexistent, as you can see, with the works of Alue Pulidan just uh, down down the hall. Uh, an artist who's based in um, in Taiwan, but draws heritage from pre -Tai pre Chinese Taiwan. Um, and these are works made uh, communi communally uh, with members of the community, uh, extended community. And the question, I think, of uh, of human and of and of human becomes more interesting here in the sense that um, so it does not you know fit into the whether it's human and non-human it is just the question of what we consider as a kind of um, formation of the human is also opened up. Next slide, please. We will pass the next. Can we go to the next one? We are running out of time actually. In just three minutes. Can you play the video? Go to the video and press play. Yeah, yeah thank thanks. you. So this is the piece uh, that we are seeing, which is by Lantian Shear. What is interesting, as you will discover as you watch a little bit of the video, uh, these are uh, members of the public walking through the exhibition space, but you realize that they're wearing a prosthetic. They're wearing this machinic um, exoskeleton, which allows 
for a change in your in your um, rhythm of working because it supports you. So think of it. Like, I mean, we've seen you know movies which have got much more dramatic versions of this, but these actually are used by factory workers in certain parts of Japan. And what is interesting is that he's sort of interested in um, what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean to sort of the off the off human and the off human in this context, right? What is the relationship with the prosthetic? What is the relationship with the machinic? It is generated from the human. We often pass on our responsibility to it. We often turn to it for support, and yet we often we also equally sort of um, lay all blame on it. So this is an interesting kind of dialogue that he's uh, opening up, where you can put on this prosthetic and walk the exhibition. Um, having a transformed bodily experience entirely. Yeah, next. next slide. So one of the, uh, one of the argument that we would propose uh, as a proposition is that Biennale should be seen and Triennales, these are par excellence temporary structures, should be seen as a kind of a form of tenural intensity. Now this tenural intensity is something, next slide please. Tenural intensity is something that a friend, an urbanist in, uh, this is the Shanghai Biennale opening, uh, the, the line, not the opening, the line outside. Uh, the, before the before opening. Before the opening. So what is interesting is this kind of uh, intensive, next slide please, an intensification of protagonists, of people, of queries, of curiosities that come together to inquire and investigate the present, inquire and investigate each other. So this, this form, uh, next slide please, an urbanist friend of ours, uh, Solomon Benjamin argues, next slide, the argues that what we need to understand in the world is through a idea of a tenural intensity. Now this is the Baldwin's table in a house that Baldwin stayed in for South of uh, for 15 years. Now this is fascinating is in Spotify, we found the whole range of the music that Baldwin has been using in this, uh, listening in this house, the French and the articles about the friendships, the conversations. So these are all immaterial forces, the sound, the friendship, conversations, uh, food, perishable, but they form a temporal uh, formation that then travel as an intensity all over the world. Now this, this idea of the Baldwin's table is becomes a, a, for us a met metaphor or an allegory for a way to look at the tenural intensity that produces us a possibility of remembering and thinking through how a Biennale is supposed to work on us or uh, does work on us. Next slide. Yeah, so I mean, just to say that this question of the, you know, the idea of ownership is a fiction in the sense that the table might have belonged to one person, but the stains on that table over time, the stain of meals, the stain of wine, uh, different presences, that is what made the, 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 the structure of the table have the kind of uh, seepage, the kind of um, time in, in built in which, which only could be possible over time, over the fact that multiple presences, multiple ownerships of time happen on the same, on the same space. That is, I think, uh, what what, and what Solomon Benjamin would also argue is that when you look at tenural memory, it is a mode of, of life. And when you try and um, say, look at a piece of property as a kind of just in terms of, of the fixity of ownership, he would call it the fixity of death. And I think this is to us this sort of it, it may seem like a binary, but because it in, you know in the sense that life and death are kind of absolute binaries, but um, this idea that we must look at perhaps at spaces not only in terms of who owns them or what kind of momentary or the idea of the present is experienced, but also what intensities they carry over time. And so the biennial in that sense becomes like a, a modality for thinking about the layers of time that exist over exhibitions. Uh, Eva has already been like 10, uh, 10 you say, or the oldest one since the 70s, and Momentum's already been 10 editions, and I think Yokohama has also already been like seven so, now. We were the seventh uh, edition of the Yokohama Triennial. Next slide. We're running short. Okay. Next slide. Uh, so actually, we yeah we are kind of running short of time. Next, next slide. We're just going to move quickly through the fact okay, so that just, the um, okay. just to say that you know we we sort of. We were interested in the question of how one, uh, while tenural time on the one side, but also non-linear time on the other. And we were interested in sort of a disaggregation of space and time that we could 
uh, open out through the experience of the of the of the triennial in its entirety, not just the exhibition. So we had, uh, for example, we we printed the 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 curatorial essay or uh, our kind of central thesis as well as the sources that we developed which we were sharing not only with the artists, but all members of the public, which we already uh, published in, uh, in November 2019, so that you could come to the exhibition knowing uh, already and having debated perhaps uh, what some of the theses were. Uh, we also began, we had a series of episodes Next that slide. we were doing over the entirety of the, of the, of the triennial. And these episodes, the first one actually happened a second last. It was meant to be an after party. Um, an after party that was supposed to start the exhibition. Um, Next slide. And, and here is another instance of, um, of uh, extension of which we are always interested in because the exhibition is one moment of articulation. When we're talking about how uh, layers get made, obviously one has to extend. You know, we've just heard about the two publications that went in momentum recently. Uh, this is, for example, another publication that happened in Shanghai. But what is interesting is that this was actually looking at the idea of personae that inhabit the city. So this had, in a sense, nothing to do with either people, those, the figures that were part, that were part of the personae of Shanghai were kind of an extension of the idea of the city itself for the city itself, a kind of- It is still continuing. And it is a continuing, actually, it continues by the people who started it. Um, because, it, you know, it's not, it's, the interesting thing is often people think that the biennial uh, proposes for others who come uh, to, to participate in it as artists that they are shown the kind of context so that they understand, you know, whatever they're coming to. But what we also wanted to open up was what does it, what does an exhibition have or offer Next as possibility, as possibilities of conversation for members of, Next of the, of the city that already, the, or the landscape that are already part of it. This is, um, let's, next slide. yeah, next. We'll do just two, we'll take just a short two minutes to say that the, when the Yokohama Triennale started, it was locked down. Artists and curators couldn't go there. It was, it was an experience online mostly. But what was fascinating is that the artists and everyone participating over the period of time, next slide, uh, produced for themselves a possibility to take that 190 days as a site of production, a site of continuously producing yes. for text, Images, works, conversations, gatherings, Next and slide. this and this intensification of so over the period of ninety days, uh, it was it we produced about forty to fifty new works. Next slide. And this group uh, of three artists, three artist curators, uh, Lantian Shi, Cabello, Malatse, and Michelle Wong from Hong Kong, Cape Town, and Dubai Next produced slide. an intensified uh, idea of time and conversation and works online continuously over the period of the finale. And along with it, next slide, uh, along, I got stuck, I think. Yeah. And what we call, what the, what the possibility that they produced was that calling in of new protagonists and the blurring of spatial coordinates. So where people are coming from and what kind of people are called into contemporary world Art, contemporary art world and who will constitute the idea of the artist and the speaker on art that became a completely reorganized and re repositioned and Next that is slide, one of the most uh, uh, endearing and learning experience of the Yokohama Triennale yes. was that with the pandemic lockdown and the emergence of the digital as the site of the Next. making of the new community site of the making of the contemporary what we witnessed is Next. the making of the blurring of the spatial coordinates of where we all are assembling from Next. and the nature of the assemblies that and the gatherings that we all encountered. Next slide. Yeah. Next. Actually, and next. I think, and next and next. I think we will we'll skip we this. will not talk about five million incidents which is also a um, uh, uh, but uh, we can talk one line that uh, from uh, uh, Kaushal Sapre worked with us and Arushi works with us in studio works in Yokohama and they were doing, doing this curatorial project uh, they were doing the digital aspect of the curatorial project that we were doing in Delhi for one and a half years five million they produced a very interesting line which was that there is a line 
practice and then there is a meeting of the dot the dot is the gathering yes. that happens and the trajectory is the line so what they ex express yes. is that the line of the practice the artistic practice and the dot of assembly are expressed now yeah i think we're going to end with that with this idea that there is that there is no such thing as a kind of um event that does not have any kind of lines of flow and the question is how aware is one of those lines of flow how one um enables the fact that they can flow more freely uh, in more kind of rhizomatic or fractal possibilities and what happens when they intersect what kind of points of intensity what kind of um expression can these lines of flows uh, find in moments of expression such as um, so in, in, in any exhibition but especially one such as an as a biennial because of the kind of specificities that it has and i think we can talk about that later that permits a different order of expression than say a museum situation um, uh, sorry what hey, we'll be. yeah well on that note <laughs> thank you Thank you both. Uh, thank you both so so much for a very rich and incredibly um, incredibly uh, poetic, I would say, um, presentation. Especially given the the, the conditions of, of of mediation and and dissemination. And I, I suppose for me, just to reflect a little bit, um, having heard you for the first time speak specifically about uh, Yokohama, but also maybe a little bit about Shanghai and some of the kind of language of um, of the language of um, that tries to kind of like escape uh, fixity or tries to escape this uh, binary or, or, or polarities in, in a way. So the, the idea of the trans global rather than the trans local or thinking about toxicity, but in relation to care and how these, these, these things often toxicity and care don't often go so well together. But I think the introduction of this idea of care and cleaning and looking after and taking care of the visitor and but also, uh, you know, some very kind of poetic and very um, challenging ideas around kind of repair and um, reworking or reimagining forms of life when there is none, you know, when, when we are all dead in a way, and you introduce debt as the one of the few kind of fixis, fixities in, 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 in all of our lives. But uh, so I'm just, I'm kind of going through like a lot of like, a lot of kind of, language of connections and disconnection and then also like introduction of different different circuits and different temporalities and 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 also to to realize that that that, that, that the the, the tri triennale in a, in, a, in, a, in a sense may may be a very raw entity for you still uh especially given the last last 12 months or so but to have such clarity at a moment of rawness and also a moment of separation as well uh, not being able to experience many of the things that you've presented and not being able to, to experience them in a in a kind of present way but also but so experience them differently without that kind of like uh, the phenomena the phenomena of, of, of being there um, so I think there's there's something for me also very much within this kind of play of the ontological and the phenomenological so moving from the experiential to, to not notions of being or becomingness and so forth so it's a very rich and, and uh, uh, pre presentation, and also uh, I, I watched uh, that uh, the, the films uh, earlier, and I was very very moved by them in terms of thinking about care and looking after and, and so forth. So so I, I I just wanted to maybe just bring up some of the, the questions of language and how language maybe maybe comes to define. Um, define what we do particularly at a moment when 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 the the phenomenon of, of experience or being there is is, is 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 perhaps so difficult but i i'm uh, been collating questions um um since the beginning of the 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 event and uh, one of the questions that come up uh that's specific for for you monica and Jibesh, was uh the question of the pandemics um the inevitable question of like how how will curatorial practices change post pandemic and, and I'm, I'm not asking it's an enormous question i think it's a very challenging question to respond to but maybe this is a question that i can ask all of you but i think specifically monica and Shibesh, given that that the the, the triennale was so 
heavily affected by by the conditions of production and so heavily heavily kind of responding to this this new paradigm or this paradigm shift or this new way of being global in the world when we, we we cannot gather and so forth so if you if you if you were prepared to maybe respond to, to that question in, in, in your own way see uh, one, one thing uh, I can say is that when the pandemic started in February uh, we thought it was like SARS because see pandemic has been happening for the last 20 years and we have traveled and uh, uh, travel was blocked for 15 20 days and then it again starts you know like that so it, it was part of an imaginary of travel uh, mm -hmm. imaginary of doing things so what was interesting was that when the lockdown hit delhi which was uh, one of the quite late uh, in the, it's march 23rd which is quite late in the pandemic cycle because pandemic was declared in uh, february or january uh, we thought that it will be possible to go towards the beginning and then slowly everybody started realizing that this is something unprecedented and so the whole thing got that we uh, and then they decided to come that they would do this so for us it was that the preparation the conversations with artists the preparation with the curatorial environment in Yokohama was something that we uh, understood more in this space the, the mm. trusted your conversations and intuitions more and that is what uh, and the trusted the how do you call it the spatial intuitions and judgments that we had made in our conversation with the architects with the fabricators and the museum uh, here and the team in Yokohama more and mediated intimately I guess the question, however, of what it does for curatorial practice per se in the long arc, I think this is, I don't know, one of the things is, I think that's the question. And I was trying to think through this. Um, to me, I think this, the, you know, we use the word transglobal and I feel like this is something we should just flag and keep as a kind of marker for all curatorial uh, practice, mm -hmm. I think. There's going to be a tendency around us, which is going to be a kind of hyperlocalization, partly from reasons of control from the state for lots of logical reasons, but also I think because there's going to be that sense of, you know, of, of hunkering down, of trying to pay attention to just what is around you because maybe we haven't been paying enough attention to it. Um, and that I think I have already begun to hear sort of whispers of. But I really feel that we, I would like to reiterate that it is only when the conversation can be destabilized by those who are not perhaps the ones you can protect or the ones you can control that it becomes a, a, a conversation that might offer something different and offer something more. Uh, this is the one, I don't know what it ought will happen to the to curatorial practice, but I would say that this is something we should be attentive to the fact that it remains a trans-global curatorial practice without the kind of self-flagellation. There were lots of problems and obviously we cannot return, quote unquote, to the time before to a kind of, you know, uh, what is called jet curatorial proclivities. But there is a big difference between, you know, feeling culpable for the way the world is and asking for different things from the world. And I think that is the one thing I would just like to say. Mm -hmm. would, would Mark and uh, Marty like to reflect a little bit again on the, the question of the post-pandemic curating, but maybe more specifically in relation to uh, the biennial model uh, rather than curating uh, more more generally but given that biennales, triennales and large-scale international exhibitions have have uh, mobility and globalism and interconnectivity and travel as, as, as a key component of, of, of their, their model tourism cultural tourism and so forth and uh, so maybe if you could both reflect on the specifics of your your, your own context yeah, I can start, Matt. Okay, uh, it's a uh, it's a very it's a crucial uh, question right now on a curatorial level, of course. But we can't forget the, the problem of uh, supranationalism as well, 
that uh, the, the difference between the local and the localism and then this desire for an, uh, other types of, of dialogues, what you were talking about as well, like there's this uh, danger of uh, closing dialogues at this moment. So I think that we all have to be aware of the need of, of other voices and the, the, the definition of platforms and temporalities for these other voices. I think that what we can see right now clearly is a different type of performativity while visiting exhibitions and the choreographic side of it, it's extremely different and it's going to be different. And it doesn't mean that it's a bad thing. What we can see at this very moment is that the length of a visit to an exhibition, it's longer than before because you are aware of you are doing something that is a cultural situation and you want to be there to participate in another way. It's also the question of ownership, like the, the person that is there uh, knows that owns this situation. And it's interesting in terms of who owns a place, who has the voice, who can use this voice. So I think that it, it's going to be more based on this uh, other ideas on temporality, but there's an, an important question as well on uh, the institutionalization of these platforms. Because right now we are talking all together, uh, and it's because it's a uh, Helsinki Biennial or isn't this thing. But the system, the the grid is the same one that we could could have at home. Mm. So there's something on on the the type of voice and how the how the mediation of this voice is going at this very moment that is different. It's not about budgets anymore, probably. It's all other types of, of uh, activities that can appear. And I think that there's, a, there's an option there on these other types of activities or these types of, of these discursive voices that, that had no place because uh, what we can offer now is time, probably. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's really interesting hearing everyone speak about this. Um, I mean, there's, there's so much to say. And f for me, I'd never... Uh, I had no framework of reference really for ex for experiencing something like the past year but i guess you know having been involved in art and um you know over the past 15 20 years or whatever there's there was a, there was a sort of a, a pre-existing sense that you were pushing for something that was going to be um you, it felt like the frontier was was in in the excess of what was around you it would be you know like the the the, the thing to break through um would uh would, would were almost the, like the social and relational ceiling so in a way the the best idea that you know i had for art and i'm just being kind of anecdotal here was that it would be like super social and it would be connected and things would be produced in excess of what was immediately available right and in fact, what happened was was something that I certainly just did not expect. It's like everything withdrew into the into the personal and into the domestic, just in, in spatial terms. Like public space was completely shut down. Um, and of course, I'm only speaking in an Irish context. Um, but that in itself, I think, took quite a lot of a sort of psychological psychological adjustment. Um, so, I mean, that's just a sort of like an immediate personal response in, ter in terms of in terms of either like I, I felt that w when we were making decisions around remodeling the, the, the BNL, given that most of the, the program was already in a kind of late stage of development, I always felt there was like an ethics to do something and not to do what I saw others do, not that I want to beat on other people or, or anything like that, but I didn't want to defer and delay and postpone. And, and I, in a way, the, the idea of that scared me much more because I felt that what was at stake was the very idea of contemporaneity. So it felt that the, the, there was an ethics in actually just trying to do something, no matter how impoverished or how limited that might be, but to just try to, to, to work with, with what was available and within the terms of the law and within the within the, the the horizons of the technology that was available from from you know from my mm -hmm. laptop to, to to actually just try and make things possible, and I guess with that spirit, um, we we were quite surprised in actually being able to develop much more of a a, a program in the autumn of last year than we than we had initially thought, and that was not just online, but you know outdoor program or um, 
programs that were, or presentations, projects that were possible for people to view, even when the country, um, even when restrictions in the country were limited, limiting people to travel more than five kilometers, for, five kilometers from their home. So we, we began to sort of program into that, into, into those limits. And like I said, it was, um, in the end, we were kind of surprised at how much we were able to achieve um, in terms of the future, and I don't want to take up too much space here, I mean, I don't really know what to say. I mean, I certainly think that, um, I think that the, the, the kind of method, I think we've become aware that so, so much like curatorial method relies on, um, relies on travel and relies on a whole infrastructure of travel-based opportunity that connects artists to curators to events and that has that has well just if not shut down then it's become completely transformed by um you know by digital platforms so i think i don't think it's going to change curating actually i think it's going to change the kind of motivations of actually of what am i trying to say i think it's going to change some of the, the, the motivating factors that, that bring people into curating and uh, ultimately that's where I think the difference is going to be. Perhaps, uh, Monica and Shivesh, maybe you could reflect a little bit about uh, upon the the going ahead, or I assume there is a certain moment within Yokohama which was about like, how do we go ahead? Shall we go ahead? You know, given that you know lockdowns were happening across the world at different kind of scales and different temporalities but but the, the, i'm not asking you to, to 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 go too deeply into this this question of like permission but but you know at a certain moment somebody decided that it was a good idea like matt was saying that you know culture shouldn't stop culture should continue and 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 it's the only way culture can actually exist as is as a public is a form of publicness uh, to retreat into into the domestic is 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 not not a role for for culture per se. But I wonder if you could reflect a bit upon this moment of permission or this moment of the decision to to maybe go ahead and and, and in whatever form that would take. Um, you know what is interesting is because when all of this started, then there were this discussion about on postponement or not, and what was what what we heard from the city of Yokohama because. It's an, because it is the main supporter and you know the key sort of you know the key players in the triennial, um, and and so they were after, after these conversations, what they said was that the the year of the Fukushima disaster, the year of the tsunami, they had also been uh, Yokohama triennial, and what had been incredible is that the number of people who had come to see the exhibition or to be in the triennial was like it had ratcheted mm -hmm. up in spite or perhaps because of the event. And their sort of thesis was, or their feeling was that when things are tough, when, you know, when it seems like things are going to be difficult to narrate, the people turn to art. Uh, and so in a sense, the city almost felt, or the, the museum almost felt like sort of, like it had to, like the exhibition had to, I mean, um, or that it needed to, uh, and it, it was a very, uh, reasoned argument. It, it was a very convincing argument, and to be honest, from in from our perspective, it was an important argument because uh, even though we know, as we, you said, the phenomenology of of exhibition making and besides the you know all the things we talked about, but um, but yes, uh, the, the fact that you know you, that when one encounters modes of narration of the world, uh, and one has to sort of engage with them in dialogue with what one is experiencing, reasoning, feeling, then that dialogue in moments of stress can perhaps be more uh, assertive. Assertive, yeah, why not? It can be more assertive. And I think it's also interesting because there is a foregrounding of the infrastructure and, and, and the platform and the protagonist. And by that, I think what we're trying to say is it really does show to you what, when something like this happens, what is what are the kind of infrastructures that are made available perennially and momentary, uh, in that moment for what is considered essential for people, right? And, uh, and you know, we've seen enough memes saying, you know, in the moments of this, it's not, it's not the two hours you lost doing X, it's the art you turn to that you will remember. That is all that people are talking about. The books you read, the films you saw, the music you heard, and the art that mm -hmm. you virtually saw or whatever. But I think 
what is it that is considered essential what are the infrastructures made available what is the idea of infrastructure about not just in terms of like the institutions but also what are the other ways that art becomes accessible to to um, to the idea of the citizen in that sense to the idea of the public so so much actually becomes foregrounded in something like this discussions become as much about what is art they also become as much about governmentality they also become about civil society they also become about do people see themselves as protagonists in their own society or are they just numbers which are sort of filled in um and what is you know what what kind of platforms art can turn towards i mean i think just saying that a lot of things get unpacked when we open out a question like this and you know like what is most interesting is the idea of the artist assembly last one year like now it's almost like one year one year march to march i've never heard so many artists in my life i'm not joking i have at attended so many artist assemblies so many talks and what is fascinating is the language and the breadth of the conversation that are produced by protagonists in art world and artists themselves so this idea of the artist assembly as a possibility had always hanging next door and it was always there but never activated because of the uh, assumptions. assumptions around inabilities or capacities or maybe even the infrastructure was not mobilized around it this is something that has shifted and one of the reason i say is that business as usual will never appear again uh, however much mm -hmm. everybody may want to. what will do is this this sensibility of the artist as a as some someone who uh, brings into gathering produces gathering to make life mobile for others and make like happening for others that is something will percolate into art practice so okay. infrastructure and gathering will become very central to not only curatorial practice but to the artistic practice and also the the the, the protagonists that shape and changes transforms biennales and structures and invite people they will also be transformed by this infrastructure this turn i i think it's also maybe important to first to, to acknowledge that like prior to the, the pandemic that the the model of the the biennale was was already and forever being being critiqued for various different reasons uh, such as climate change environmental crisis increased mobility increased uh, bombastic ridiculously scales contemporary art being produced specifically for these these international events but also the the travel as being a kind of a key component of the kind of global experience and then also how contemporary art is incredibly entangled with money and the market and capital and so forth so it, so there's already this kind of machine of negativity uh within within the field of of contemporary art and contemporary art criticism ag against the biennial as as a model of course it takes on different shapes and forms and modalities but i was wondering if 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 you were able to like maybe go back a little bit in time to maybe think about some of those conversations pre pandemic in relation to the biennale as 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 uh three subjectivities if i include rocks as a collective subjectivity uh that have been very invested in the in the in the biennale model and this kind of uh, version of the global in relation to to contemporary art and how it is is very much entangled with with uh local identities and ways out and and as an essential force for for for, for living for for many of us absolutely um, yeah. and uh, but, yes sorry no no that's it okay yeah but it's the thing and you know, we can we have the clear image with venice so it's uh, the question was before the the questioning on the model on the industrial side of the biennial was there it's like mm -hmm. the tourist side that has been in question not the gathering not the the not the possibility of thinking not the intellectual construction not the 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 perception of the relation with art so this is the machinery that has been like observed from a capitalist idea of the this uh, uh, model probably and this is why i think these uh, these 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 gatherings or these tools or this assembly that, that you were talking about makes sense and it's much much more transparent right now it was always there but the power of the image of of the industrial side it's strong what is important now it's also to see that yeah uh 
is in the gathering, is in this type of talks, in this context, in this context that, that we can also construct together uh, other con yeah, narratives around the world. Because the one that is in media, it's too polarized to be uh, connected to many people. So you have a distance with the construction of welcoming from media. And suddenly, uh, Yokohama can be a good place to talk about, okay, what's going on with me in this reality and how to relate with other people and how to have this complex uh, construction of, uh, of the everyday life. So I think that there are still possibilities for, for the gathering and there's a need for a gathering. Let's see what the format, of course, and, but also this, this, this extreme necessity to, to, to feel together is there and will be there forever. And art is also... Uh, uh, a good feel for it because it doesn't come with answers. So it means that we can continue with the conversation with many other people just to make it more clump, more complex. And this is what uh, we want in the end with all these experiences. This is why we continue probably with with Eva, for example, year after year from the 77. It's like there's a lot of experiences that are there and they are not ending. Same thing with Venice. It's like it's never ending and it's it makes sense that it's uh, out of time. We also need some references that are out of time to understand what's going on today, right? So there are this, this kind of dislocation and all these uh, polytemporal situations that are interesting and will be interesting. And I think it's, uh, this is one of the reasons we need to continue and we will continue working. The format, let's see. But one of the good things, supposedly, about the biennial is that this uh, uh, quite long time before like when you are preparing a project, when you are talking with the artists or with other people, and there's, it's not something for the next month, it's something for two, the next year. So it means that it can be a, a more uh, post dialogue uh, going somewhere else. And this is something that we should keep somehow, this, this possibility to think together on a, on a slowness that can give other, other options and other, and other types of vocabularies. Monica, is your best you want to? reflect a little bit on that. Yeah. On this question. Yeah. No. Yeah. One of the one of the most interesting uh, thing about the like yesterday I was talking day before I was talking to a friend who teaches uh, in a university and uh, in an MA very fascinating MFA program and he was saying uh, that the the students come with a ready made critique of the Biennale as a neoliberal project. Now, the, what is interesting is the ready-made critique of the neoliberal project is with everything, you know, like as if as if you mobilize the term, it is self-explanatory. So he was saying that one of the most interesting thing is that once you start disaggregating, taking a certain moment of any Biennale and a set of work or a set of propositions, then they get completely entitled by it and tries to investigate. So this relationship between uh, investigating and an a priori a priority dismissal. This, this. I mm -hmm. think this is the tension in, a, in a, in a kind of a, you know, this kind of critical common what Ranse would call the critical common sense. The critical common sense would have this a priori kind of you know, kind of partitions, and then you will produce a series of investigations, and then those partitions break, and this new distributions of sensibilities mm -hmm. But what I, what is interesting is that with the Biennale, I think it is a collective rethinking that those a priori dismissals or those a priori suspicions may be uh, maybe didn't do the justice to the complexity that the intensity of the conversation that it was inviting to a site. So the, yeah. the conversation that was like for us, the Yokohama, the kind of conversation with Yokohama invited that trans global intensity of from the very intimate personal to a kind of uh, uh, the kind of complex weave and velocities that is circling all around the world and then being present during the pandemic and being relevant with the, the artist's work being evaluated by everyone. Being, we did a conversation with Tokyo University curatorial students. They found it like they, there was this problem. They thought it was retrofitted. The work that has been shipped in January and February, they thought was made it after the pandemic was declared pandemic, you know. So in that sense, that that finding artists very in, in, intensely uh, present in the pertinent, present, pertinent, relevant, 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 pertinent to the better word, is something that gives us a confidence that there is a subterranean, and we wrote it in our, there is a subterranean mm -hmm. current that shapes us. 
that antoshira which we mm. call is something that shapes us that waves that's and that we i think in the pandemic time we all have got a sense of it now it will be on our critical faculties and on our abilities to give that a uh, certain infrastructural and a certain kind of play in our lives and in our uh, institutional or curatorial artistic works i i have uh, i have a question from janet doyle for um i think it's 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 stemming out of something that's uh that matt said in relation to the irish context uh, the relationship between the local and the global and uh, I think the question is um, uh, the future of the Biennale how this interrelationship between the local and the global may expand or may be reimagined um, beyond the beyond the specifics of an Irish context maybe that's a question specifically to you Matt because it's there but maybe it also could be a question uh, for all three four of you sorry um, so the question, the interrelationship between the local and the global, uh, specifically within the context of Biennales. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, Jeanette, for the, the question. Um, I mean, Eva has always really operated on, on, on that, that kind of footing, um, sort of by default, really. Like, it's always, I mean, Limerick is a place that, as, as I said in my presentation, has, has relatively limited infrastructure. So the place um, and its specificities make itself very present to um, to and within to, to artists that, that produce are invited to produce work there, to curators that undertake research there, and to any presentation that um, holds ground there. It's it's almost impossible not to uh, feel the tension of those um of of those local factors and i mean over the years i mean of course many curators have have, have tried to work um with 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 that local fabric very very explicitly um i mean it's difficult to really think of how that you know like the future of that as a sort of what what are the, what are this what is the sustainable future of that because as I was trying to indicate in my presentation, and my argument is that the, you know, the, the, the local is at, um, cer certainly in the way that Eva came about and in Eva's history, in a situation of, of deficit or in deference to something, something other and something beyond itself. So sustaining a kind of local and international relationship is also one of like trying to en like engineer two moving parts. But I, I would say that, and this relates to a kind of previous question, I mean, we've been thinking, you know, pre-pandemic of like re re remodeling our, our, our program so that it can be a little bit more generative in terms of like what we hold on to and, and what is accumulated over time and between different, different kinds of additions. And, you know, um, you know, whether that's in introducing like, you know, cur curatorial scholarships or even introducing different um, temporalities. So we've been exp exploring ideas that, that rather than, you know, operating, operating on a kind of biannual cycle, that there are actually different temporalities, different projects that are kind of in play at, at any one time. And, you know, there's less concern actually around the kind of like how the format of, through which they are output. There's more emphasis, in fact, on the inputs, like what we put into them and the, the, the trajectories that, 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 that flow through an organization like this that can be supported with, you know, um, uh, you know research and, you know, other supports that we can bring. So to be more like input focused and less output focused. And I think that, um, that is gonna, yeah, kind of quite radically shift you know, an organization like EVA from a, like an event based organization that really measures its impact in terms of like output into an organization that is much more about like, you know, to use some of the words um, that have already been used in, in, in this webinar, like it's more about assembly and it's more about sort of cultivating um, um, 
and co coercing sort of different energies and different contributions into the organization. Um, that's the best that I can do on that whole uh, uh, global local. <laughs> That, that's fantastic. Thank, thanks a lot, everybody. We've been we've been in the conversation. Sorry, Shabesh, we've been in conversation now for like maybe thirty to thirty five minutes, and I I will want like to call Tara Elfing on in a few moments. But before that, um, maybe Shabesh, if you wanted to comment, uh, uh, but I also had maybe one specific question around the question of assembly, particularly at this time. I, I think the relationship between assembly and this the essential uh, necessity for art during this particular moment, uh, I think is a very interesting uh, souvenir that I would like to take forward within this discussion. But I think for many of us who've been invested in contemporary art, it is it has always been this argument that we've had to make, uh, why is art important? Why is it significant? Why is it essential to the way in which the world funds and the way in which our lives are 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 you know transformed and so on and so forth and and I, I think one concern I have around this maybe these assemblies which are now kind of happening digitally online and so on and so forth is that there there's a kind of a flattening out in some way of, of, of how we, we, we engage with each other, which means we don't have the messiness of the social or we don't have the messiness of the experiential or we don't have the messiness of the, the street fight in a way. <laughs> and so I think it's it, there's something about this like competing webinars and competing Zoomatrons and competing uh, online presences that, that, that I think it, it is, is productive, but also maybe something which which we've yet to kind of ref, be able to reflect on uh, in a way that's, that, that might be able to imagine a future that of, of interrelationship between this online presence and this offline presence. And many have talked about glitch feminism and, and, and so forth and these different ways of um, taking away this separation of online and offline work or off human or on off, off human or of human worlds. So maybe if, if you would like to maybe just reflect maybe one of you on, on, on something that's in relation to this idea of digital assembly and competing presences when being online. Or maybe not. We can start. I think that all of us can answer, but. Uh... <laughs> maybe, maybe just a short response before I bring in Taru or Wood. No, one of the, you know, one of the things when we uh, started Sarai, and you mentioned it 20 years back, and one of the things that we have been discussing for some time now, we used to run a mailing list, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. the mailing list used to be like NetTime, uh, we were influenced by NetTime, Net, and they were, uh, they, they gave us the server initially, and then we, mm -hmm. the server was from Amsterdam. What was interesting was that you subscribe and there was, a, we had over 14, 1500 people, and then mail is to come every day on your desktop. I remember my academic friends getting really troubled. He said, I received this inane mails of people commenting on each other, three lines, four lines. But now I look back to that archive, it is there online, you can say Sarai Reader List Archive. It is one of the most engrossing archive of the present, of the of the of that time. That you get a sense even with Okui writing there. There's so many different kind yeah. of people wrote there. So what is interesting is that you have to give it a, that's with the tenural memory that we are talking about. You have to give it the tenural, the, there is a tenural, how can you say the, uh, like we are taking, there's occupation, you know, there is a various kind of occupation that is happening, which is producing a density. And that density over time transforms the way you would all uh, experience your, uh, the next phase. So that reader list produced a kind of image of South Asia, image of even the even the world that was shaping around, did transform a whole lot of people as to how they even approached what they were doing. Artists, journalists, scholars, everyone. The, the sense of the public was is, is created anew. And this sense of this mm -hmm. public creating anew is very, how do I call it, is very unknown to you. It 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 happens with you. You are because you are part of it. This happens with you, and there's a kind of an 
renewal and, and a new form is produced around you, which you are very unaware of, but you realize in your head the conversations are multiple. And, you know, this conversation today and actually somewhere will reside and that will play out in different ways, in different way. So momentum has moments have momentums, you know, <laughs> each moment has a <laughs> Yeah, it's also connected with it's also to to your question and connecting with you that there's also this fragmentation that it's uh, happening at the same time. This uh, multiplicity of, of of meetings, but all together are dealing with uh, uh, the same situation. So it makes sense then to talk about the local, but also this interlocal, and to have this feeling of possible connection. It's more a feeling than an, it's more an intuition that that a reality because the amount of information is too much right now to be understood or to be processed as individuals but there's something that it can remain there for the future and that too, that it's a representation of our time and then of course the artist it makes sense that it's a, as a catalysator of something that it's a, this perception of reality through the artistic practice is one of the best ones and we know it and this is why we work with art right because we know that this is uh, an extremely advanced system to be able to to recognize uh, our times I mean, just just to say, the one thing that I do think is it has been missed is, and that is certainly important for a project like Eva, is the kind of incidental encounter. You know, the incidental encounter has it's it's, it's not. I I can find no format for recreating that digitally, because with these kinds of events, um, you know, it relies on um, on like communicational consent in a way that like putting a sculpture next to a train station or whatever doesn't you know so i'm i'm i do have concern and i have an in, like an interest in in how we might recreate like incidental encounter through through digital and online means in the future if indeed it can't be um it can't happen in in, in public space uh, thank you for thank you to all of you and um, please stay please stay stay uh, with us uh, for now I've I've invited uh, Tara Elfing who is um, a curator writer uh, from Helsinki to um, maybe reflect uh, feedback a little bit of critique to what Taro has heard or what everybody else has heard in your presentations but also Taro is. Um, been very much committed to the, the kind of intersections of ecological feminism and decolonial thought in her in her practice and is currently the artistic director of the CAA uh, Contemporary Art Archipelago and I know that many of you um, have, have worked with Taru are familiar with Taru's practice and someone who's very committed to working locally but also with a, with a kind of global international perspective so I've asked Taru to 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 maybe see join us and maybe just feedback a little bit of uh, critique reflection and if we have time um, maybe for one or two responses at the end uh, I've asked the the media company if they will keep us open and keep our, our link open uh, until we run out of run out of energy run out of flow uh, not that long but uh, almost that long uh, but I. Uh, Taro, if, if you could join us um, and uh, say hello. Hi. Hello, everyone. Oh. Really great to see you all uh, from my little detached bubble in Helsinki. Um, and um, yeah, it, it, it was great to listen to all your talks and, and get kind of uh, reconnected to the world. Um, I think there's a delay in my um, video. I don't know. Can you hear me all right? So is there a delay? Yeah, there we is, can hear yeah. Okay, yeah, perfect. Um, I have to disappoint you if you're waiting for really sharp critical um, views. I have about 20 pages of notes and uh, and Paul kindly gave me this impossible task of kind of somehow <laughs> drawing together sort of some threads of kind of clarity, you know, and, and clear kind of reflection uh, from these talks. But uh, I'll do my best, you know, and maybe these are more kind of the, uh, thinking aloud. Uh, that hopefully connect some dots um, along the way. Um, so when I came to the uh, event, I have kind of I jotted down some notes for what I was, I guess, thinking, you know, uh, preparing for for the discussion, and, and thinking of this um, 
kind of, I guess, in expectation of that moment when we emerge or re-emerge out of these bubbles of detachment where we are at the moment. Uh, I think what you were just discussing about this sort of, um, these sort of uh, uh, encounters that are kind of not possible now, I think we're all quite sort of sorely missing a lot of that um, kind of informality and and and, and surprise and and and, um, and and kind of reciprocity that cannot really quite happen in the same way uh, in in this uh, digital media. Um, but so when so where do we emerge though? Where do we emerge when we kind of emerge out of this detachment and and you know, where we're kind of, at least I feel kind of out of touch at the same time when I, well, there's a sense of being rewired in our connections and relations, you know, really intensively in the last 12 months. Um, and so kind of how do we orient then when all of these kind of coordinates that we used to, or we assumed that we knew uh, protocols, as, as you were mentioning before, the kind of rules of the game in a way um, have kind of somehow shaken uh, or are shaking. Um, and the kind of time is even out of joint somehow. Um, and so um, so I'll do what I often do, uh, which is sort of somehow start from, I guess, sort of like really quickly situating where I'm speaking from. Um, as you talked about, you know, the, the sort of situated your practice in particular by a new context. Um, I'll, I'm kind of um, try to really briefly situate where I'm, I'm kind of uh, sharing my thoughts, you know, at the moment from, um, and, and so, here I am um, on the shore of a sea um, where Paul is also, of course. Sea that is not really a sea, as at least I know Monica and Tupesh know. Uh, but it's actually a kind of brackish body of water uh, that is actually a, it's a sea in formation rather than a sea. Um, and uh, and I thought this was maybe you know interesting to bring up because we are within the context of Helsinki Biennial that is very much positioning itself now in relation to this very sea, the Baltic Sea. Um, so there's a kind of specific temporality and, and sense of location that comes also from from this very, very particular place. Uh, so we're kind of I'm I'm sort of on a shore that is rising uh, on its own, very steady, slow rhythm um, since the last ice age. Uh, while at the same time the sea is globally rising with uh, ever more unpredictability. So there's like actually very kind of we already have these very uncertain coordinates. It's not only the pandemic. Uh, that has thrown us into this sort of situation of not having, not knowing anymore how and where and when to place ourselves. But it's been a condition that we've actually uh, felt and, 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 and sort of experienced and also worked with for quite a, some time. And I think that sense of um, that Chipesh was referring to the subterranean current, it's definitely there's a number of these currents that I think we've all already sensed that have really sort of just come to the surface maybe now in the last 12 months. And, and so how to, um, so it is quite a big task now in a way to think of how do we make sense of a biennial or how do we make sense of how a bi biennial could make sense uh, in this moment or post this whatever moment of stillness and unsta uh, instability where we find ourselves now. Um, so how do we kind of, um, I think what came through in, the, in, the, in, the, in your, all of your presentations was really interesting as well that there were kind of shared points uh, of, of kind of questioning around that kind of how do we trace these sort of continuities that it's not just a question of break with the past or break with something but it's actually a kind of a um, there's a necessity to kind of think um, and trace and rethink or retrace continuities in a different way uh, in order to find our groundings again somehow anew. Um, so really, uh, um, just a sort of really uh, trying to stick to some sort of simple coordinates, while at the same time we're obviously faced with uh, huge complexity. Um, so um, I just thought that I'll just throw in some of the um, questions or thoughts that uh, that I collected from the presentations around the coordinates of time and space, basically where we are, and and how do we kind of think of biennials in this context. Um, so starting with temporality and time. Um, it was interesting how in actually in, in all of your presentations there was a kind of reference to the present and, and, and the present as a kind of, maybe the, um, the biennial has been defined very much as the present, as something that kind of captures a moment or a present, uh, the kind of uh, that 
condition of contemporary, contem contemporary is something that has been very much defining it. But actually, in all of the um, presentations, there was an emphasis on 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 much more complex sense of time, um, uh, looking at the past, uh, looking at the histories uh, or the past, uh, but also a kind of sense of futurity. Um, and so I think there is definitely a kind of moment of, of uh, need to uh, somehow shake that sense of present uh, in, in different ways or to kind of allow that to be kind of rethought through these different um, uh, different sort of directions, I guess, uh, that are not actually linear. But I, I think exactly what came through as well is that the kind of looking at the past in order to move forward, it's not a linear action at all. It's not even simply circular, but there's actually a really complex interweavings going on. Um, how some some things date and some things don't, uh, and, and, and how they kind of, uh, when, when the past is in different ways resurfacing all the time um, in our work and our lives anyway. Um, the kind of question of event, the event as a kind of, not as a, um, as a fixed temporal moment, but rather kind of a collection of intensities, for example, uh, on a kind of more um, unfolding manner um, in, in practical terms of actually just uh, extending something from 10 weeks to a, a kind of a year of slower unfolding events, for example, or the kind of recognition that there's all these different lines that are happening that are actually part of the events anyway, even if there's only a certain aspects that maybe are those public uh, moments. Um, uh, the repetitions and returns that are built, built into the biennial as a, a, in its logic or the, I've always felt that there's a kind of potentiality of, of really building on something that has that kind of repetition, rep, repetitive structure somehow. But how do you kind of play with that? How do you build on that? You know, where uh, the kind of repetition is always also changed and it kind of um, allows for that, um, especially for the locals, um, I think, the people who are able to live with the biennial in that sense. Um, I think there's a lot of these references to the time being out of joint. Um, obviously, because that's how many of us feel now at the moment. Um, but also this emphasis on kind of multiple rhythms or continuities, that there is a kind of plurality uh, rather than a time. Um, so that kind of really challenges the whole notion of the contemporary and the present. Um, and at the same time, the sense that thing we're experiencing now, at the same time, a kind of radical slowing and a kind of quite radical acceleration when thinking about the kind of what is actually happening in terms of physical movement or uh, or, or kind of um, a travel, for example, uh, and then the digital acceleration of, of our kind of interconnectedness. Uh, so what does that mean? So that kind of connects in a way um, to what I was sort of jotting down notes around the kind of space of how do we locate our practices now? Um, what is the kind of where are we uh, in the kind of this transglobal? Um, or, you know, the question of Nordic, for example, is interesting how now it really becomes somehow clear of how certain um, regional um, coordinates uh, are very much the geopolitics of the past and they carry a kind of a lot of burden, uh, but maybe there are a lot of possibility as well if we want to and are able to uh, re kind of uh, think those. Um, what I thought was interesting uh, that came from Eva and the kind of really long history of, of development of a, of a kind of small, very kind of locally um, grounded biennial is that sort of um, the, the sort of international uh, and local or the kind of periphery global, uh, periphery center um, binary. And how, um, while you were all talking, I was thinking of how this sort of whole center periphery, periphery dichotomy itself has been decentered quite radically, just in the last 12 months, but also already before that, that, you know, first by this travel, this accelerated travel that has now all paused, but now it's been shattered even more by digitalization and how, how we are connected. Um, so the kind of, maybe the mystery is gone, you know, the kind of, uh, to make a new biennial in a place like Helsinki, you cannot rely on that kind of, um, the power of the kind of the periphery in a way as, as being kind of uh, tempting or interesting because uh, the kind of international curator has not been there yet. You know, that sort of uh, logic doesn't maybe work anymore the same way. We have to rethink of what does it mean then uh, to work somewhere. Um, 
And uh, and so that kind of regrounding or rerouting is definitely uh, something that came through as well. And I very much kind of like the idea of, of um, the local local visitors or the local audience as an archive rather than the organizational official archive being the archive. You know, of kind of where is the biennial? That the biennial is maybe most of all um, actually in the memories or in the in the kind of personal sort of whatever uh, you know photographs you know of, of uh, locals who've kind of been living with a biennial um and uh, and how what can we learn from that in a way um the sort of vernacular archive of, of a biennial um but then also the kind of emphasis on local artistic field you know that i think somehow of kind of how do we how do these uh, or any uh, structures within the arts how do they actually really support uh, the artistic field, you know, locally, uh, but also in its in, in its really more and more complex connections that are way beyond any regional or or sort of geographical um, boundaries. So there is kind of um, at the same time, this sort of local is kind of getting ex extended. It's sort of getting extended in in a sense of community. What is our community? Um, in be, you know beyond human as well, but also kind of in in, in really complex terms, uh, from micro to macro, uh, um, peer networks. What other kind of how I think the whole notion of local artist is something that doesn't really hold you know into, within those geographical boundaries anymore. Uh, artists relate their, uh, themselves and their practice in a, in a complete way, different ways uh, now to who they see as their peer networks. Um, and the whole, you know, how do we, the whole notion of field, what is a field is being extended or, or blown up in many ways. Um, the question of infrastructure, what is the kind of, how, where is the infrastructure? What is the infrastructure for a biennial? How that needs to be kind of also thought in much more extended sense. And, uh, and I think the kind of point about the co-development of actually really thinking of how do we kind of co-develop these are ways of working and infrastructures is, is, a, is a really uh, powerful and, and important call today. Um, so I think somehow there's a kind of, um, I feel that these sort of extensions of whatever might have been called the local um, and, and uh, or the binary between the local and the international, um, there's a kind of, this for me resonates with this idea of, of kind of emphasis on these different scales of intimacy that uh, Monica and Chibesh brought up. Uh, that there is a kind of, we need to think through these different scales. We need to see that kind of, and understand or somehow kind of um, sense their interconnections. And they are, there are intimacies that there are, even when we're working on a kind of bigger, when we think about a field or a uh, you know, infrastructure, you know, these are also, there's a kind of intimacy there uh, that on these, on all of these scales that have to be um, recognized. And I guess this kind of brings me to the to the last thing that I wanted to bring up, and maybe something as a kind of if we're not going to get thrown out, you know, from <laughs> from this conversation because we've run out badly over time, uh, is the question to kind of maybe reflect on what are the kind of what is the most urgent in a way to repair and care for now. Uh, that kind of how do, what what is it that we really need to pay attention to now, uh, and how do we start paying attention? to these things. Um, and, uh, and I think that is also something, of course, that is not, there is not a universal singular answer to that. So that's why maybe I wanted to kind of, that could be a place to sort of end, to, to share those different points of uh, where and what to start with when we start with the kind of work of repair and care today. Thank you. So, yeah. I would like to thank you all, and with my one available hand, my other one is not, I'd like to, uh, if you could all put your hands together for each other and say thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, thank you to everybody, thank you to everybody who's joined us um, and stayed with us for the last uh, few hours and 20 minutes, and uh, to let everybody know that our next event with, um, uh, Navak, Gabi Nagobo and uh, Rebecca Lamarche Fadal will be um, on the 31st of March at 4.30 uh, Eastern European time, Helsinki time. Thank you very much, everybody, and take care and see you all. See you all soon.